So where did you get these? I got these from a guy on a street selling his hand-rolled uh, cigars in Tarpon Springs, Florida, which is the, the Greek capital of the country, basically. It's uh, just north of Tampa. He was just on the side of the road? He had to stand on the on the sidewalk there, yeah. Yeah. Stand? It was he had like a table set up? Table. Yep, and he put out his How hand How cool rolled. is that? It's awesome. Did he yeah. say where he got the tobacco? Uh, no, no. I was just, uh, we had a great conversation about, you know, Tarpon Springs and all the Greeks there. And um, and then he, uh, we just talked about cigars. And uh, uh, this is his Churchill brand. And that is, I'm not, I can't remember what brand that is, but... Uh, now, what makes it a Churchill brand? Is it the size? I think it's the the length, because you have those classic, you know, pictures of Winston Churchill, mm-hmm. and he's chomping on a cigar, and it's it's kind of long. So these longer, thinner ones they call it a Churchill. Did you ever watch the movie on Churchill? What was it called? Do you remember? No. It was excellent. Yeah, you know, most of the movies you watch today, you're like, oh, it's just a waste oh, I, of my time. Yeah, I think this was went, excellent. Yeah, about ten, eight, eight years ago. Yeah, this is yeah. going to be good. We're going to test Catholic Jamie's skills. I can hear him clicking away over there, looking <laughs> up the movie. We'll or maybe he wasn't. Yeah, I was. <laughs> yeah, it was really good. And apparently, he would smoke in the morning. He'd wake up and get a cigar. And I think he would. The fame. One of the. He's got many famous lines, but one of them. What is it called? It's darkest hour. Now, can they hear you through that microphone? No. It was, it was called, called darkest, darkest hour. <laughs> I wasn't sure. That's cool. Darkest Hour. It's worth a watch. I it's think w- I may have seen it. As I say, there's just so many movies today you watch, you're like, that was just awful or a waste of my time. This was excellent, yeah. yeah. Um, and another, another one of his favorite famous lines is, um, I guess somebody found him on a train and said, Sir, you're drunk. And he said, Yes, but tomorrow I'll be sober and you'll still be ugly. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, remember, I remember that one. Yeah, he's very good. He's, uh, he's a man who rose to... Uh, to the challenge of his time, you know, there's the uh, that old that old adage that uh, you know we were brought here by cowardice and we're getting out of here by courage, mm. and uh, he really embodies that, you know, for uh, um, you know mid 20th century uh, Western mm. civilization. Uh, it's just through this through the the sheer force of his or his oratorial um, skills yeah. that that he was able to you know rouse a nation. It feels like the opposite's happening now. We were brought here by courage, and we're getting into this through cowardice. Yes, we, we're, we're we're slouching towards uh, capitulation yeah. um, through through uh, through cowardice. Yeah, yeah. Um, you're a Ukrainian priest, Ukrainian Catholic priest. Yep, born and raised uh, Peterborough, Ontario, just mm-hmm. outside of uh, Toronto. You and Cameron may have been there on a net trip or something. And uh, yeah, so we've been here in in the Pittsburgh area for uh, seven years now. My wife, Helena, and our seven children. Yeah. How did you meet your wife? I was, uh, at the time, I was a Roman Catholic seminarian. Mm. Um, and uh, my, uh, kind of a long story, but, uh, you know, I got a long cigar. So That's just... right. That's the beauty. It's like we <laughs> cannot end until that's done. <laughs> so uh, my spiritual director at the time was, uh, was by ritual. And I, I didn't quite get his, you know, um, fixation on, on icons and whatnot. But um, yeah, these are glorious icons. We should. Which camera could we point them at, Neil? Let's do. I'm gonna switch to this camera and then I'll point it. So that Ooh, we'll yeah. Okay. See, this is why I had to get Neil. It's before him. It was just me and someone mm-hmm. from the university. Oh, yeah. If you hold it up, hold, yeah. hold that up and hold it still so they can get a good. This is what. This is one of the most beautiful icons I have ever seen. I think. I it down a little bit. It's catching the light. Though. Yep. So this is written by a a priest's wife in Ukraine. And uh, she just does it out of love of our Lord. <coughs> they have six kids. And uh, and then can we show them this one too, Neil, before you? Mm-hmm. Sorry. I yeah. thought you had to go back. So. Oh, but you were just one. checking. This, this is so beautiful. Same lady? Or you let you hold and it because it's probably is, focused on this you. Is, uh, now, this is a, a, what we, I would call a, a hybrid icon because it, it, it really embodies uh, a tradition, a devotion that's... Um, a private revelation that's very popular in in the in the West, namely that of Our Lady of Fatima, but the iconography is is done in the according to the tradition of of the East, obviously. So this is the icon of Our Lady of Fatima, which she also uh, wrote for for my parish that's in, in Carnegie. Was she was she like an? I mean, how do you get that good? It's a gift, you know. Yeah. It's. Uh, I mean, was she? Was she? Uh, I'm sure it took a lot of time and effort, but was she just naturally gifted at art in the first place, and then started writing icons? Or? Yeah, Mariana is her name, and she, uh, 
as far as I know, she just always had a proclivity towards art, and she she gave her her talent to uh, you know to the the upbuilding of God's kingdom, and her her talent was you know was in like was artistic, and so she she uh, gives glory to God through uh, through iconography. Um, you were mentioning your wife. I think that's how we, you were a Roman. I didn't think I don't think I knew that you were a Roman Catholic seminarian. Yeah, and then what happened? Well, I, I mean, I, I kind of we grew up. We didn't. We grew. We weren't even baptized as kids. We were. We had no f- religious affiliation at all. And then when we were about eight or nine, my brother and I were baptized. Mm, how and come? Just you know, we. Um, th- that's a mystery to me, to be honest with you. You know, my dad just said, you know, boys, I think we're going to get you baptized. And uh, we were the. We went to a Catholic school, Saint Alphonsus in Peterborough, and uh, um, we were the only unbaptized kids, I think. <laughs> and uh, so I think probably it was confirmation or first confession or communion was coming up, first yeah. Holy Communion. And and um, so uh, so that's why we wanted to go along with the rest of the class. But then we never went back to church. You know, we, mm. we just stopped going. We never had anything to do with church after that. Um, and then I, in mid-high school, I had a, a conversion, you know, um, and that's a whole other topic, but just just reading and praying and talking and and things began to move in my life. So after high school, I thought, you know, there's nothing better, nothing better in life than to give everything to God. So the idea struck me one day, hey, I why not be a priest? And it was just like I was hit by a bolt of lightning. Yeah, there's nothing else I want to be. And uh, up until that point, it was always you know I was vacillating back and forth. And, um, you know, what do you do? Be a teacher? You know, I, I like baseball. Me, I would be a baseball player. Um, and uh, the idea came, be a priest. It's like, yeah, I'm going all in. Not 99%, I'm all in. And I was in seminary and had a spiritual director who uh, was into iconography. And, and he said, you really need to, you know, explore the East. And I, I didn't have any... Why did he say that? Uh, my spirituality, the way I looked at things, the way I looked at God and prayer and liturgy... Um, and uh, so I kind of just brushed it off. And um, that summer, as it so happens, my job fell through and I had nothing to do. And uh, through a very long series of amazing little miracles, I found myself on an airplane uh, landing in you know the former Soviet Union in Ukraine, of all places. And um, uh, I, I got off the airplane. I looked at what was then known as the Lviv Theological Academy. Now it's known mm. as the Ukrainian Catholic University. Yeah. And I uh, met my wife there. And uh, I went back to the seminary a few uh, months later, a month and a half later. And I, <laughs> I just, I mean, I couldn't stop praying the uh, Tranquil Light Prayer from, from Vespers. I couldn't stop praying the prayers um, uh, from the Divine Liturgy. And I was in two worlds, so I came back to the states where I was studying at the time, and um, and uh, you know I'm I'm at mass or I'm at morning prayer, and my my whole soul is back in in Ukraine, mm. praying the divine liturgy or praying great great vespers. So I knew I couldn't continue. So I was asked to go and study in in Rome, and uh, I I said I, I I can't, you know, in good conscience I couldn't I. I was so f- fixated on two things. So. <laughs> I, was say, I was waiting for that <laughs> shoe to drop. So yeah. there is a, uh, the whole liturgical, theological experience of this underground church that had been persecuted, but mm-hmm. this absolutely stunning, beautiful, um, extraordinary young woman named Helena, and I, I just couldn't get my mind off of her. And uh, so at that point, I, I was torn between two directions. If you were able to be a married priest in the Western Church and marry Helena, would you still have become an Eastern priest? That, you know, I've thought of that, and I think I would have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, just the the way I kind of, you know, saltwater fish belong in, in salt water, and just the, the the way that I I look at, you know, uh, prayer and and um, the Lord and. Uh, I, I, I approach it as as uh, as the East has. That's just my propensity is in that direction. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, quick question: Why is it correct to say Ukraine and not the Ukraine? I, I, can, I know that there's something there, but I don't really understand. Ah, good question. Yeah. So we don't say like I, I'm moving to the Alaska. 
you I know, see. I'm, I'm moving to the New Zealand. Right. Um, so it is, uh, it's the name of the country is Ukraine. Now, the, the origin of that, I think, is because Ukraine, um, in its roots, really means borderland. So it was like the, the borderland um, because be- between Russia, Rus, the land of Rus, you know, uh, what they call Rus now is R- Russia, but that land between Russia and, you know, Europe is this swath of borderlands. So they would, you know, people think the borderland. And uh, so they just translate that oh, I see. that mental construct of the, the borderland between Russia and Europe um, and so they tra- they just see. transpose so when, that to so say the Ukraine. So when somebody says the Ukraine, it, it feels like a bit of a slight, does it? Like it's a, yeah, yeah. It's, it's not, not really a country. country. I yeah, see. You're, you're you're not you're you're not people. Good to know. So there you <laughs> go. You're, you're not a free nation. You're just a yeah. you know a periphery. You're, you're a, a swath of like the prairie or something. You're a region, but you're not a freestanding nation. But cool, yeah. yeah. When you meet people in public, uh, when they recognize you as a priest, how many Orthodox people think you're an Orthodox priest? Uh, not, not too, too many. No, not too many. Well, um, I mean, what kind of reaction do you get walking around like that? I mean, um, usually, you know, uh, they'll say hello, Father. Um, if they're the big crucifix helps, doesn't it? I mean, yeah, the, the beautiful big crucifix helps. Sometimes, if they're if they're uh, Greek, um, you know, the, the, the Greeks have a, a great devotion. Uh, uh, love of their tradition which is you know to, to kiss the hand of a priest mm. um that's beautiful it is and uh, uh but usually it's just hello father you know and uh, say a prayer for me father but uh once in a while you get like the the byzantine uh the eastern greek catholic greeting you know glory to jesus christ mm. uh and i know i'm home there when that's it, lovely yeah yeah do, uh, do you know um father lewis a uh, uh, ruthenian byzantine priest down in atlanta no yeah yeah no different church i know but um that reminded me of uh, something he he became our priest before we moved up here and i uh after his first divine liturgy we were all kissing his hand uh and it's just a beautiful thing i mean this is the hand that brought us christ you know but uh, he said something really cool to me later he said i think i, I need to grow in humility because that was awkward for me mm which I think some people would say, well, in order to grow in humility, you should stop doing it. But his reproach was like, it's because I'm not humble that that was awkward. Like, yeah. this is about Christ. This yeah. isn't about me. And I thought that was really insightful. There's a beautiful uh, story about that from north of my hometown. If you go up to Cumbermere, Ontario, there's mm-hmm. um, Community Madonna House Been founded, there, yeah. Yeah, founded by uh, Catherine Doherty. And there's this uh, beautiful story. I don't think it's apocryphal. I think it's uh, you know it's true. Is uh, you know she being from Russia and. Uh, you know, people in Russia, Ukraine, Belarus, they, they hold to this uh, tradition of, of kissing the hand of a priest. And so some young priest came up to Madonna House and, uh, you know, after liturgy, she pulled him aside and she tried to come up and kiss his hand. And, and I mean, she, she's a woman of, of, of great... <laughs> Stout woman. Yeah, she, she's a well-known woman and known for That's her... not what you're going to say, crap. I thought you were going to say, like, big woman. <laughs> no, 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 and then I went the wrong direction. Well, maybe she was stout. stout but, but beautiful. She, Russian. Lovely. Continue. Yeah, she, she was spiritually stout. She, okay. she was very... Uh, and you know, physically. Continue. Um, and uh, so this, this renowned woman in the spiritual life comes up to kiss this guy's, this young priest's hand, and he, he pulls his hand away. And uh, she says, you know, Father, give me your hand. And, and he, he says, no. Yeah. And uh, she looks at him and says, Father, I would never kiss your hands. <laughs> you kiss the hands of the one whom you represent. Amen. Now give me your hand. And sheepishly he puts his hand I out. I love you know? it. And yeah, that's so beautiful. Yeah, but it, 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 it's it's humbling for a priest to do that because you realize you're just a vessel. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. it's it's like it's not me, it's not my hands that they're kissing. It's the one whom whom I represent. You know, in the, in the West, we feel like many of us are traditionless people. You know, many of us might say, well, from Ireland, Irish heritage, English heritage, but but many of us don't have the the meals, the drinks, the the different things that sort of uh, were symbolic of our heritage and and since the reforms of the second vatican council it feels like even what we did have in my estimation were kind of taken from us Mm -hmm. and i really do think that's in part why so many catholics are drawn to the east we we want something stable we want a tradition so either either you know we we want to go back to the latin mass we really want the traditions that were taken from our parents yeah and not in an angry sort of way although it might come off like that at first because it's just awkward to reclaim a tradition that isn't yours but I think this is partly why we find the East so beautiful. It's because it's, it's like you know who you are. You have a memory. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. It's, it, it's an unbroken memory and it's not contrived. You know, you have, you know, some communities in the West where their link to tradition has been broken, you know, through no fault of their own, and then they have to kind of uh, cobble it together mm-hmm. again. Yeah. And, yeah. and the, the advantage, and good, good for them, you know, for trying that. But the advantage of the Eastern churches is that they've gone through no liturgical trauma in the 20th century. They've gone through other trauma, but liturgical trauma has not been their lot. Mm. They've had this 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 uh, continuous stream um, of of liturgical life, and uh, so they've they've been able to maintain that. And uh, Western Christians come into it, and they're just awestruck. Um, but you know, one of my parishioners, Bill, was telling me, uh, you know, I was exp- showing them the the uh, the discos. We use like a discos, like the Latin rite does, but it's elevated, so we call it the the uh, the um, sorry, the Latin rite calls it the paten, and we we can't just make it simply a paten. We have to put you know something pillars. underneath it to lift it up, you know, pillars <laughs> yeah. carved out of ivory or something, and uh, <laughs> and then we call it a discos. Well, uh, on top of that, we put um, the the lamb, the bread. That's going to be consecrated, and then once you finish those prayers, over top of that, you put uh, what we call an asterisk. I should have brought it with me, but it's a it's, it's like a metal four prong tent, if you will. And uh, he was telling me I didn't know this, you know, and he's a layman and he's just studied this. He says, "Yeah, we in the West had that." Really? And I said, really? Like in all my studies and, and, and reading and conversations, I never knew. They said, yeah, up until um, I think around 1963 or 62, um, you know, it was part of the pontifical mass. The use of this, the, the asterisks over, the, over the, the bread that's going to be consecrated, you know, they would, they would have that. And so I, I just bring this up because when you're talking about tradition is that when, when people go to like an Eastern Catholic or an Orthodox church, um, they're not abandoning the Western liturgical tradition. What they're really hap- what's often happening is they're just re they're they're encountering that tradition that was never lost in the East. So there are many things that are common to the Eastern and Western patrimony, uh, which which the West may have dropped in the past half century. The East maintained it. So that thing isn't exclusively Eastern. It, it, it's common to the apostolic deposit. But the Eastern churches just maintained it, and and the Western churches are invited, encouraged, you know, to to go back and reclaim I mean, their that's, tradition. That's true to a degree, but it's not as if if the West were to reclaim its tradition, it would look like the divine liturgy. Obviously, oh no, 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 you know, no, yeah. that's not what you're saying. No, yeah. I'm not saying that, but I'm saying like, for example, even uh, the even the uh, the gate. What's that called? The iconostasis. Yep, the iconostasis. Uh, my understanding is, in the West, at some point, there was something like that, which was eventually reduced to the altar rail. Yep. And even that was then taken away. Yeah, if you look at some of these old, old, old uh, cathedrals in England, you see uh, these, um, I forget, I don't know the exact term, of the rude screens, I think they were called, R-O-O-D. Um, but you, you see the, 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 the rudimentary um, uh, iconostas. You okay. know? So, so it's something that's shared between yeah. East and West. You know. Um, what about language? I mean, people who go to, say, a Latin mass... I do now, but I, and I don't, I haven't been doing it for that long, so I don't consider myself sort of embedded in that community. But, you know, if, if, if the Latin mass was to be said in English, a lot of people would be upset about that. And presumably the divine liturgy was celebrated in these different languages. Was there a sort of revolt against, I mean, I know you have the divine liturgy in both Ukrainian, uh, and, Ukrainian English. and English, Yeah. but was there a re- a revolt against using the common language? And, no, that's... And why not, do you think? You can go back to Cyril Methodius, you know, and their evangelization in Moravia, modern-day uh, Czech Republic and parts of Slovakia. And, um, you know, right from the get-go, they were using uh, the, you know, the, the vernacular. Mm. Uh, so that's been, that's, been, that's been specific to the East, mm. is this um, uh, use of, of the, the language of the people. Mm. Um, the, the West maintained you know bishop peter elliott from australia speaks about you know the west maintaining its sense of mysterium yeah. through uh through the the lens of language mm-hmm. whereas the the east maintains that sense of mysterium through the lens of you know uh the the icon screen i see that uh, th- makes th- sense that's yeah. his take on it but um uh yeah the, no the east has always had this um habit of of using the the language of the people mm. yep yeah. Now, mind you, it wasn't a street version of it. It was always an elevated sense, mm. and uh, you know, you get by you know the time of like, the early twentieth century, 
you know, the language that was used uh, was, um, uh, you know, a, a, what we call Church Slavonic, which uh, had become kind of rarefied and uh, antiquated, and people didn't always understand some of the words. Mm. Um, but you go to Ukraine today, and our Ukrainian Greek Catholic churches, they, they use, um, you know, common Ukrainian in their, langu- in their liturgies. I think it's... Um common today for many western catholics to look to the east and just to celebrate it for one because it's just it's foreign in a beautiful sense you know um but do you think that there are certain things that the east can learn from the west oh absolutely what would what would that be yeah there are a number of things i mean one of which is um the importance of of uh an activated laity so the the east tends to be very like uh, top down uh very clergy heavy um, and this idea of of, of lay people uh, taking on the responsibility of evangelizing uh, is 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 not well developed in in the East. Uh, I, I'm not speaking about um, some of the um, activities of like the, the the OCA or the Greek Church here in the United States. I'm speaking about in, in their their homelands. This idea of of um, the, the the Eastern churches having a, a, a formed and activated laity. Uh, they really need to look to um, to the Western churches to see what the Western churches in the past 50, 60 years mm. have done with their their laity. Like your program today, you know, uh, this kind of stuff, where you look at like in, in Pittsburgh, you have the Renew the I Do. You know, just lay people who are on fire with renewing marriages, preparing people for marriages, um, teaching women about, you know, modern fertility and, and uh, you know, a- avoiding contraception and using the, the splendor of their bodies to regulate fertility, things like that. Well, this is done by lay people, mm. you know. And uh, so that's something the East, I think, really needs to learn. Or the, yeah, the, the East yeah. really needs to learn. Yeah. Now we got a mate, Derek, who we were hanging out with last night. He said we could mention him, so we will. Derek, and I guess that according to Benjamin, who's a regular viewer of this show, I apparently reference Derek a lot. I don't mean to. I just talk to him a lot, so he's on my mind. Yeah. But, you know, Derek, it was a Protestant pastor who only last year became convinced that either of Catholicism or Orthodoxy, yeah. and so left left his role, which takes tremendous courage, yes. especially when you don't know where you're going or what you're doing. I mean... Uh, props to him for that. I don't think he gives himself enough credit. But right now, he's in this position that I imagine a lot of people are in, but it just doesn't get a lot of airtime. And that is, I don't know what to do now. I'm looking at orthodoxy and I'm looking at Catholicism and I see the beauty of both. And part of me is attracted to Catholicism. Part of me is not. Part of me is attracted to orthodoxy. Part of me is not. I mean, there's a lot of YouTube videos, and I'm responsible for this in part, that say things like, you know, Protestant pastor becomes Catholic or... Orthodox priest becomes evangelical. Yeah. Right. And these people speak with this tremendous clarity as if it's so obvious. But I think there's probably a lot of people today, in part because we live in this kind of multicultural, multi-faith society where I just don't know what to do. Uh, and you brought up something interesting last night about converting today, looking at orthodoxy and Catholicism, a lot more difficult than maybe, say, when Scott Hahn was discerning. Right. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah, like, uh, you know, the mid, I think Scott Hahn converted, what, 85, 86, you know, mid-80s, and uh, you have this um, movement now in, in, in the United States, you know, 36 years later, with uh, in which there are Orthodox churches and Eastern Catholic churches that are, you know, more uh, mainlined. You know, they, they've, they've embraced English more, and uh, they're offering services in English more, and um, uh, I mean, that, that wasn't the case 40 35 years ago. And so for people who were in in his position, yeah. uh, they were evangelical pastors. The only apostolic church that was offering anything was was, was the, the Roman Catholic Church. Um, uh, I mean, th- there are exceptions to that. Uh, you had, you know, P- Peter Gilchrist back then as well, but it was just kind of na- a nation. Who's movement. Peter Gilchrist? He, he was an evangelical pastor who uh, converted and, and became an Orthodox. Okay. Um, um, so anyhow, you, you, you get this thing that's happened in that you now you have uh, other apostolic churches which aren't in communion with Rome, and and some are, like my church, uh, which are offering praise and and, 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 and liturgical services in in English. And so now it it, um, it is easier, I think, for someone to look at that option 
than just the, the Latin yeah. option. Um, before, you know, if you're converting in the early 80s or the mid 80s, is that th there were a number of conversions required for a potential convert. There's the theological conversion of joining a new church, but then there was also the cultural and the linguistic conversion that was required. You know, yeah. uh, all the services were done in you know uh, Romanian or, yeah. or Hungarian and or Ukrainian, and then there's all the the cultural baggage that goes with it and um for a lot of these people like okay i'm willing to make the the leap of faith and uh do the theological conversion uh for my wife and kids that's just not fair to expect them to also do the linguistic and cultural jump i'm not going there and that's what he's experiencing now being at a serbian church he says very heavily ethnic it's yeah. beautiful he says the people are lovely for the most part the music's glorious but it, it is i mean for i see what you mean in most places there has been this sort of what would you say, anglicized sort of influence? Yeah, yeah. Um, maintaining the traditions, but he doesn't feel as heavily ethnic. Whereas yeah. for him, it, it does where he is. Yeah. And that's been hard. It, it, it kind of reminds me of the, um, <clears throat> you know, our Lord saying, you know, don't don't let your, your light be put under a, under a, a bushel basket, you know, and, and, and hide it. We need to let our light shine. And I think now more than ever, the, the Eastern churches in North America in a, in a secularized society that's like desacralized, yet you know, the presence of the sacred is just nowhere to be found on, uh, on, on, on Wall Street or anywhere, is that we need to be loud and proud, you know, now about the presence of God Almighty. And uh, if that means sacrificing um, uh, a cultural or a linguistic idol, in order to win people over to Jesus Christ, then we have to do it like now. Mm. And then wh wh what are your thoughts? I, mean, I, I, don't, I don't want to upset any Orthodox because I, I love them, and uh, this isn't me trying to take a shot at them, but you're, you're obviously Catholic for some reason. You know, so what, yeah. is, what is that reason, and, and, and what do you say when somebody comes to your church and they basically are looking at Eastern Catholicism and Orthodoxy as if it's the same thing, but maybe they'll go to your parish because the music's nicer than the Orthodox Church down the road, and that's really the only difference that they see or something? Yeah. Well, I mean, Christ founded one church, and it's, it's the one holy Catholic and apostolic church, and um, I don't want to belong to any other church. You know, that's, that's, that's it for me. If it was good enough for our Lord and for the apostles, then it's good enough for me. Um, but I mean, the, it, 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 that's the Orthodox say the same thing. Yeah. Well, here's the thing is that if it is the one true holy Catholic and apostolic church, then I pose to them this question. Show me which ritual churches you're in communion with outside of the Constantinopolitan tradition. So, for example. Explain those words for me, Okay, please. so the, the, the liturgical tradition yep. that Moscow and that Greece and that Bulgaria and all these Orthodox churches follow, yeah. it all comes from Constantinople. Right. Okay. Um, so if you're the true church, and the true church is universal, as Christ said, go to all nations, then surely you're going to be in communion with churches that are outside of your own little liturgical tribe. Okay. And that's simply not happening. You know, Moscow is not in communion with, for example, uh, the, the West Syrian tradition. They're not in communion with any of the ancient churches from the East Syrian tradition. They're not in communion with uh, the, the, uh, the Coptic tradition. They're not in communion with any of these things. They're just, they're self-contained. And because they're self-contained, I say that although they have valid sacraments and they're, they're, they're really, um, there is a, they're sister churches, as the Vatican said in the Balaman Statement, they're not fully embodying and living uh, the, the Catholic faith. Hmm. Uh, now, you look at, at Rome, despite all of its you know, current problems, um, and it, that which should not be understated, I think. <laughs> I mean, because but, I think when we understate them, we, we, we turn people off like Derek and others who right, are looking yeah, into Catholicism. When, it, when they get any whiff of us being like, well, it's not, you know, like it, right. they're like, no, it looks bad. It, it looks yeah, yeah. really bad. So, so yeah. we don't want to just you know, brush that off. But yeah. the, the thing that can be said about Rome is that you, you can be in communion with Rome as I am, and this proves its universality and its Catholicity, is that people who are in the Roman tradition— you know, the highest Latin mass goers, they are in Eucharistic communion with people who are in the Semitic tradition. You know, they, they pray in the language of our Lord, you know, the Maronites, mm -hmm. you know, the, the West Syrian tradition. They're ancient. If you're not in communion with people who are still praying in the language of Jesus Christ, something's wrong. And so here, uh, a high Latin mass attendee in Steubenville is in Eucharistic communion with people in 
the East Syrian tradition, the West Syrian tradition of like uh, East Syrian tradition was Saint Saint Ephraim the Syrian, wow. and they're in communion with people who, from out the Coptic tradition. We have Coptic Catholics, you know, yeah. and uh, th this is and Armenian. The Armenian Church is extraordinarily ancient, um, and we're in communion with that tradition. So the fact that we're in communion with all these ancient traditions, twenty two different churches, that indicates that we belong and are connected to something that transcends the linguistic and cultural tribes that mm. make up the human family. There are Western Orthodox, aren't they, who celebrate the, uh, uh, the Latin Mass? Yes, they, they've come up in the past uh, 40 years. Um, but they're not looked on favorably by many Orthodox, my understanding is. Correct. They're, they're seen to be some. appendages, mm. um, and they are, um, uh, they, they'll celebrate the the serum right you know from uh, the old old right out of England yeah uh, but their their communion is with uh, you know uh, usually the Russian hierarchy mm. you know what I find fascinating is the old Russian believers is that what they're called yeah the old, I, old I, believers the old believers I'm sorry yeah, yeah in Russia T tell us about that because I, I think I know a little bit about it as far as how they broke off after the reforms and how they refused to change how they made the sign of the cross and things like that I find that stuff fascinating yeah yeah so um, very much like what happened to to the um, the Latin Church in uh, liturgically in 1962 to 65 and up to 1970, um, uh, you know, an analogous reform of sorts took yeah, place in yeah. the 1500s in uh, in Russia. They were trying to become sort of more in union with the rest of the Orthodox world with changes in the liturgy. Yes, yeah, so, so there there were um, discoveries, uh, manuscripts and whatnot from the Greeks. And uh, they wanted to uh, align with um, wider usage. So the, the hierarchs in Moscow uh, made these reforms. And uh, uh, these reforms were uh, fiercely resisted uh, by the people, uh, such that uh, many, many, many of them were martyred. Um, and, by uh, who? By, by the Russian church, by the Tsar. Wow. Yeah. So uh, they they were um, so so that they they followed uh, uh, the old old rituals that. Um, Tell us about some of them. Well, I, I'm not an expert on them. Well, you have to, you I'm know. not either. But I just I'm thinking of the, the at least the, some of the things that you see today that are kind of iconic of that tradition: the prayer mat and the the Lestrovka. The, the Lestrovka, yeah. yeah, yeah. I wish I brought mine with me. Yeah. But, Do I? Anyway. Yeah. And the, the way they, they make the sign of the cross is, is a little different from yeah. uh, from the others. And some of the uh, um, the liturgical translation was different. And uh, um, things that are, and people might say they're just superficially pious practices. Um, but for you know for the uh, uh, for the old believers, they weren't superficial external. They, they were they were vehicles of the tradition. So mm -hmm. if you're going to arbitrarily change these things. Um, then you might as well just have a, a head-on attack on the tradition itself. And so you have these, uh, the, this, this great movement of people in Russia who, who resisted and paid for it dearly with their lives, and they, they were priestless. They had no, um, uh, for many, many centuries, their communities had no priests. How do you know how they prayed as communities during that uh, time? Because a lot of us had to do that during the COVID craziness. <laughs> yeah. Well, it was the hours. Yeah. yeah, they they pray the uh, the services, the psalms, the uh, Orthodox services are um, beautiful, mm -hmm. you know, and so they 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 really um, you know appropriated the uh, you know the the divine office. Yeah, it's uh, I was just at Mother Natalia's uh, life profession, and we had vespers the night before. And I'll tell you this: when 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 a Byzantine chants, "Let us conclude our evening prayer," they're <laughs> lying. They're lying. They're not <laughs> concluding at all. They've just got warmed up. <laughs> okay, we here another hour and a half. Yeah, we're, we're, we're concluding this section <laughs> of our <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's not, uh, because yeah. it's you're entering into the heavenly kingdom. So there's no <sighs> setting of that sun. And so when we say "Let us conclude," it's just just this one segment. Of, ah, uh, that's <laughs> what it was. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, so so the uh, the um, the East has a lot to learn from the West. The East has a lot to learn from the West, it's, uh, as we were talking about earlier, not just the, the, the involvement of laity. Yeah, well, there, there seems to have been like an emphasis upon the role of the laity since Vatican II. Surely people weren't saying you don't have to be holy and you don't have to evangelize prior to that. No one's making that argument. Right. But it certainly seems like that was a catalyst for a lot of the new movements you see today in the church. Right. Yeah. Yeah. The, so I think the East could learn from that. I think the... Um, I think the the, uh, the the 
the, the centralization, the organization of, of the Western Church, um, the Roman Church, is so awesome in that it it give it, it lends itself to moral clarity on uh, newly developing ethical and moral problems, and you you get um, an authoritative and um, somewhat speedy answer to yeah. uh, evolving complexities. Ah, and, that's a really great way to put it. Yeah, yeah, and so you have. Um, all kinds of documents coming out of Rome in the past, you know, from the time of even before John Paul II, on questions like in vitro fertilization and, yeah. um, you know, uh, human genetic testing and things like that. You just don't get that in, yeah. in the East, and that that's something that. What, what's the re- what would the response be from one of these Orthodox guys who who's quite vociferously against the Catholic Church? If he was to hear you say that, what what would he say? You think in response? Typical response would be. That I mean, you have to follow the direction of your spiritual father, yeah. And uh, which, which is a I mean, start. The, yeah, but. it's a start. And if he's a man of prayer, that's good. But it it um, the, the 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 risk in that is that it can be individuated and fragmented. Yeah, you know. So well, one one spiritual father has has this to say, and another spiritual father has that to say, and then it's kind of like the Protestantization of of the moral tradition. You yeah, know, in which yeah. Each each person follows a different. A different set of moral principles. Mm. Um, so that's something that I think the East can learn from the West is just uh, um, look at this this beautiful um, formation of of uh, that the, the 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 magisterium of the Church has given to uh, these these complex uh, questions. They, they've formulated them and they've they've really handed on to today the the deposit of the faith and they've applied them. Uh, to these questions of you know when life begins, when it ends, how to act and mm. be a man of of God in the midst of it. I might be I might be accidentally becoming traddy. I, I say accidentally because I'm aware of the criticisms of of sort of traditional Catholics, and I share some of those criticisms. But it seems to me that if you have no memory, then you wouldn't know who you were. Like if you have no memory, yeah, who are you? You know, yeah. And it seems like. Um, when you throw out the traditions and then you're left with this sort of banal liturgy upon which new traditions start to mm-hmm. arise that are not ancient, like holding your hands during the Our Father. Felt and banners. Felt banners yeah. and people bringing up things in the offertory like field hockey sticks. That's yeah. my classic or, example of or, people just artwork or whatever they made yeah. at school. It, it, yeah, it's no wonder. It's like I, I want to know who I am, and uh, that tradition is so essential to that. It is. It it is. It it frees us. Tradition liberates us. It it frees us from the slavery of inventing ourselves and being slaves to uh, novelty. Yes, and uh, so you can Ooh, just. That's good. Tradition frees us from the slavery of novelty. That's yeah. good. Yeah. Yeah, and, and being a, a votary or a. Uh, a votary of the cult of the new, you know, and so it. it this is a, 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 a the faith and the the life of grace is like a river, and that river has strength because the the banks on its left and right side are firm and strong, and it affords the the river the chance just to to go. And so when we jump into tradition, we can just go. Mm. But when you, when when you don't have you know the the the, the banks of tradition. Uh, that river just dissipates, you know. It just it, it it just becomes a swamp, you know. And then you have to find ways to to move yourself down, be, you know. And so that that that's why tradition is so important. It one, one former evangelical pastor I knew many years ago said that it just became so very difficult for him every Sunday of you know h- how do I construct a, a new worship service this Sunday? Keep it exciting, keep yeah, it fresh, you know. And so. You know, for the first two, three years of, of your ministry, uh, yeah, there's some novelty in that, some excitement in it. But after 15, 20 years of it, uh, I'm the center of it. I'm constructing worship according to yeah to me. And I think sometimes, I mean, there are Protestants with liturgical um, services, of course, but I think that is one of the criticisms some Protestants have of Orthodox and Catholics. It's You see them doing these things, and it doesn't seem like their heart's in it. Uh, I was chatting with Derek last night because we went over to a friend's house and they said, should we pray the rosary? And we all kind of sat down and prayed the rosary, you know. And he said it was beautiful, 
But he said he knows Protestants who would be very critical of that. Like, because, you know, we're all sitting around. The kids are doing whatever they're doing. And we're like, hail Mary, full of grace. You know, like mm. there's this sort of, but 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 we got together and prayed yeah. still for 20 minutes. Yep. But And there's a, yeah. It, it's, yeah. And, and the same thing I'm sure with Orthodox who have been raised in the faith and they leave, say, for a Protestant group, they'll say things like, I, I never knew the faith. But, I mean, what about the old hymns that you sang and the, the Bible readings you would hear every single week? Just because not every word is said with tremendous enthusiasm and passion doesn't mean it's not sinking deep into your heart. And in fact, it's annoying when people try to do that. Like, hail Mary, full of grace. Mm. Well, like you go to a, go to a mass and sometimes the priest will just sort of emphasize words weirdly as if I really mean it this time. Yeah. Uh, that just seems like a hindrance. Yeah. These are my pet peeves. I'm sorry. You go. <laughs> so, well, I mean, the, the 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 Hail Mary is such a an absolutely beautiful prayer, and it uh, um, it's, it's all scriptural. I mean, it's it's just right from the first chapter of, of Luke, and uh, um, I, I I I like to tell people that who have a who have a difficulty with you know the Orthodox and Catholic devotion to the Theotokos that do, do you have a problem with Scripture? They'll say, Oh, I don't have a problem with Scripture. I said, Well, we're reciting Scripture, and the only difference is at the end of it, you know, we ask her to pray for us. But, you know, we, we believe in the God of the living, not the God of the dead. Mm-hmm. And do you believe that the Mary, the mother of Christ, is, is dead? Surely those who are in the presence of Christ are more alive than you and I are. And so do these people not want to participate in, in the work of salvation and, and, uh, and pray for us? So it, it's... Um, I like the Eastern Hail Mary. Yes. It's nice. It's different. How's it go? Rejoice, Mother of God, full of grace. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. For you have borne Christ, the Savior and Redeemer of our souls. Sometimes Savior and Deliverer of our souls. That's beautiful. And there is there is a tradition in the East of something like the Rosary, isn't there? Um well, I mean, the oddly enough, of Saint Seraphim is that it? I'm not familiar with okay. it. Derek was talking about that, but uh, you know, oddly enough, when you go to Ukraine uh, and Eastern Europe or areas that are predominantly Eastern Catholic, you find uh, rosaries everywhere. Mm-hmm. They love the rosary, and they're fully Eastern. No one's going to question if they're Eastern, you know. Yeah. But they they have a great devotion to uh, to the rosary and the Jesus prayer. Yeah. You know, so they're they're you know they're complementary. Yeah. They're, they're complementary. Uh, so some people are very hardcore about that, and they say if you're Eastern, you can't pray the Rosary. But um, my my response is really, well, do you have a problem if if a Roman Catholic or an Anglican begins to pray the Jesus Prayer? Well, no, they don't have a problem with that. They're all for it, you know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they're all for it. And so, what if yeah. you know? What if someone here is I, meditating you know on the mysteries? I think that comes from being the small dog in the the fight yeah. right it's like it's the reason quebec is very intense about their yes. language being primary good analogy yeah. you have to in order to survive like if quebec was like whatever i mean signs can be in english that's fine english would just rule the day yeah and i think it makes sense why when you're a small community trying to maintain your traditions that you you end up being a little elbows up and i, I yeah i can understand that well yeah and i i think definitely the the our, our eastern parishes um you mean you should be promoting the Jesus prayer. Um, uh, you should be teaching priests, should be teaching their people the Jesus prayer. Um, it, uh, but, but at the same time, there's no reason to tell people not to pray right. you know, the rosary. But, I mean, if we're not going to live out our traditions, uh, then they'll die. Well, yeah. You know, we, we can't expect, you know, the Catholics of uh, the Cyril Malabar tradition uh, to, to continue the, uh, the, you know, the, the, the traditions that came up out of the Greek tradition. You know, mm. we, we, we who are in the, the Greek Catholic tradition, um, you know, it's that, that, that treasure has been entrusted to us and that treasure has been put into our hands. And, you know, the burden's on us to, to maintain that treasure and to keep it uh, flourishing. Um, you said you were in Ukraine and met Christians or maybe the children of Christians who are in the underground church. Yeah. T- tell, me, tell me about that. Yeah, well, some of it ties into the question, a lot of it ties into the question of the married priesthood. Um, you know, one of one of these people was very interesting. Her name was, was Svetlana, and she was the daughter of a priest. And um, when, when the communists came back into Western Ukraine, in uh, 40, uh, 44, because they were there in the 20s and they were brutal. They just, they brutalized the population of the, the, of the people. Um, and so when they came back in, in 44, 
uh, they and by 1946 they they had mandated that these you know, people had to become Orthodox and eschew union with Rome. And a lot of the priests did that. They conformed to the wishes of Joe Stalin. They eschewed mm. any connection to Rome, uh, and they they signed up for the Orthodox Church. But there were a large number of priests um, who said no. I, it doesn't matter if it's. Uh, the more important dogmatic questions of the divinity of Christ or, you know, the lesser questions of ecclesiology like union with a bishop in Rome, we're not going to to give up. And uh, so for these men, they were, and their families were uh, sent to Siberia. And I met this one woman, Svetlana. Uh, her father was uh, about to give in and uh, say, you know what, they're not asking me to deny God or deny to deny the Eucharist. They're just asking me to stop praying for the Pope during the liturgy. But under my breath, I can pray for him. And all my people are going to be doing the same thing. Yeah. And uh, his wife said, uh, no. And they packed up the kids. And it was the wife who said, we're either completely into the faith or we're completely out of it. And uh, they packed up the kids and the KGB came and uh, said, what's your decision? And he looked at his wife, and his wife kind of t- pointed at him, and he said, "Okay, we're, we're not we're not signing." And so they went to, to Siberia, and she has this this her the, the daughter in this family is now you know older, but when I met her back in like ninety nine, she, she was just radiating faith, deep, deep faith in Christ. Um, so that was one of the the first experiences I had of the underground church to answer your question. Did she share her experience of Siberia at all? Um, or have you heard I, from I Christians who have spoken about that? You know, I I, I do have um, a couple people who, who did spend time there that I knew, and uh, they don't like to, to really talk about it. And uh, when I have tried to speak about it, you know, it's it's, it's very Gosh. difficult. And they've they've passed away, a lot of those, those people that I knew. Um, the one priest I... I I did have, you know, a direct experience with in in terms of conversation uh, was um, uh, an extraordinary man. And uh, he um, he both he and his wife were were deported to Siberia for their uh, their faith and for being in union with Rome. Um, And just that that resilience really edified me. Were they separated into different camps? Yes. Yeah, Yeah, they were. And. you know who knows what happened to, to those women in those women camps, uh, but they they came out of there better than they went in, um, and just I judge that just by looking at the joy in in their eyes. You know, mm. um, I, I met a couple like that up in Hamilton, Ontario, and I met this priest. The odd thing about this priest, this underground priest, is that you know we were in the the mountains of the Carpathian Mountains of Ukraine, going to the, some wedding you know deep in the mountains there, and uh, their weddings. People here think that they have oh I had a great wedding. It was like you know, whole day long. Their weddings, the Hutzel weddings, they can last longer than three days. Wow. You know, and the, the whole village shows up. You go to bed at some point and wake no, up again? No, you just keep going. And, <laughs> and now traditionally, they'd go on, like you were talking like 100 oh. years ago, like six days, seven days. Glory, they, when do you consummate? After six days? I'd be like, i got to go for a bit. I'll be back. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, well, for, for us Easterners, we're not worried about consummating because for us, it's it's a it's, it's it's a valid marriage as soon as the priest blesses you. So no, no rush to well, go. Well, it's in. valid in the West too before <laughs> the consummation, but I'd still want to consummate. Um, so so they. Uh, but anyhow, I met this priest. We were going to the wedding, and uh, I was up on this crowded bus, and it was in the middle of the summer, and they don't have you, Ukrainians have this belief in skuzniak. Skuzniak is this belief that you know if you get a draft that comes across to you, you're going to get sick. Okay. So it could be like. 900 degrees out there with complete humidity and you have you know 70 people on a bus that's built oh. for 35 and they, there's you know chickens and, and 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 poultry on there with you and it's at, it's the windows are steaming steaming with heat i've been in a situation like that and this is one of those and you're sitting there and they won't open the window because there's going to be a draft and that's going to get you sick you know oh wow so you know, some people crack it open just a little bit, so you have oxygen, you don't die. <laughs> That'd be nice, you know. And uh, we're, we're sitting, we're sitting, we were there, and uh, the bus stops, and people are, are moaning at this point because we can't put any more people on here. And uh, he opens up the door, and I see a guy coming on. He's an older gentleman, and he's not wearing any clerics or anything. But I say to my wife, I think that guy's a priest. And my wife, um, uh, now she's my wife. She says, "Well." Helena says, no, I don't, how, how do you know that? I said, I'm, I don't know, I just know that he's a priest. So he came on, we pulled him in, I said, sit down, and and uh, sure enough, I could tell just by the 
the, you know, the, the, the look in his eyes, the, 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 the bearing that he had, that this was a man who was ordained by God. And um, so I got to talk to him, and, and he was, uh, he and his wife were deported to Siberia. And, um, uh, you know, he, he didn't want to talk too much about the details, but uh, I, wanted that, I wanted that shine that he had wow. in his eyes. And that was, he didn't need to tell me about the, those details. Mm. It was the, you know, the warmth of his love, the fervor of his faith, and I wanted that. So that was another experience I had of the underground uh, underground priest. There's a book I might have you look up, Neil, because I'm going to forget the name of it. It's by Alexander Solzhenitsyn. It's called A Day in the Life of um, Something. It's excellent. I read it in one day. And if you want to know what it was like living in Siberia, I think it's suns, uh, you know, sun up to sundown. I think it's over the course of one day. It just sounded... Ivan, yeah, Ivan Denisovich, A Day in the Life of Ivan Denisovich, thank you, by Solzhenitsyn. It's a book I'd highly recommend people read, whether or not they're interested in the history of Russia and all that. I want to go to Russia so bad. Never oh, been there. Can't can't comment on Russia. I There's these Sheilas who run this cigar shop up in Robinson who I chat with. I just love them. I love them because they just seem world-weary and sarcastic. Mm. What do you want? <laughs> and I just I give it back to them, and then we just get into this great chat. I just love them. They're fat. We're talking about Tolstoy and Pushkin, and yeah, it's just fascinating. I got super into the Russian authors a while back, and I just I, part of me I'd love to do the um, Trans Siberian uh, train. Yeah, I think you go through like eight or ten time zones or something. It, there's a lot. Yeah, <laughs> there's a lot. Um, but I, I know a priest uh, who is in Vladivostok, and so my, my only experience of Russia, uh, I mean, I lived in Ukraine for three years, but my only knowledge of, of the situation in Russia today is, is mediated through my conversations with, with this priest in, in Vladivostok. And, uh, you know, what the, the, the situation that, you know, we're, we're kind of told is that Russia has gone through this conversion and Russia is a you know, kind of uh, entered into its second baptism. It's a Christian nation again. Mm. And I, I asked him these things, and, and, and he says, well, just based on the attendance I see at Mass, I, I have trouble believing that. Mm. You know, it's um, y- you don't endure 75 years of propaganda atheistic and propaganda, and that system implodes upon itself, and all of a sudden uh, these people become Christian because they're disaffected with an atheistic system. Yeah. They need to be re-evangelized. So they, they have a you know, kind of a, a, a reticence against totalitarianism, but that doesn't mean that just because they're against totalitarianism that they all of a sudden are, are you know, Christians again. Um, so, he, you know, his best estimates are that like maybe one and a half percent of people are, are coming into church. Oh, wow. So um, that's different than the, you know, the images we see of these full churches um, yeah. in Moscow and whatnot, um, you know, which isn't to say that, that uh, there, there isn't a, a renaissance of sorts in, in Russia, um, but uh, it's just I don't think it's as as uh, extensive as as we may be. I had a young Russian woman write to me and say that she converted from Orthodoxy to Catholicism in large part because of what she was hearing on pints. Wow, isn't that cool? But I was thinking it'd be really cool if there were some Eastern Catholic priests who would go into Russia and celebrate the Divine Liturgy, so that they didn't have to join a Roman Catholic church. It would seem like yeah, wouldn't that be nice? Whiplash wouldn't be as bad having to. Yeah. change your tradition in that sense that that's a, a very uh, loaded uh oh, an explosive question whoops why <laughs> <laughs> because uh we're banned you know the, the, the greek catholics are have, have zero religious freedom in russia and the russian I had federation no idea oh yeah so i i know eastern catholic priests um I, I knew of them i haven't maintained contact with them but um who are in russia mm-hmm. and they're not allowed to function as um, Eastern Catholic priest, because there is no Eastern Catholic bishop mm. and there is no Eastern Catholic eparchy. Uh, so they're, uh, from the perspective of the Russian Federation, uh, they're Roman Catholics. Interesting. You know, they're Roman Catholics. and Because uh, you could get to a Roman Catholic mass in oh, Russia. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But you can't be an Eastern Catholic in Russia celebrating o- divine liturgy. Officially, you Officially, cannot be, yeah. right? Wow. You know, wow. Um, and so that that's that's problematic. And, uh, you know, there there are... Russian Catholics who have, you know, petitioned Rome for um, uh, a hierarchy because the, the, there, there is the Russian Catholic Church very, very small now. 
has no bishop. You, know, you can't have a church if you don't have a bishop. And uh, no bishops have been forthcoming. Uh, so it, it is a problem, mm. you know, the, the situation of the, uh, of the Eastern Catholics in, in Russia. Um, but there, there are many of them, just like there are many Polish Catholics in, in Russia and in Kazakhstan uh, from the deportations. Um, uh, in fact, Bishop Athanasius Schneider, I spoke to him a few years ago, and, uh, you know, he was, uh, in his childhood, he and his family were very much indebted to uh, a Ukrainian Greek Catholic priest, uh, Father Z- uh, Zaritsky, who uh, provided them the sacraments uh, in, in Kazakhstan. You know, so the, there the, there are Eastern Catholics there, but they just don't have on mm. paper a jurisdiction that they can belong to. How many Eastern Catholic churches are there? Twenty one. Twenty one. How? Because I mean, I've been to your parish, and um, the singing's beautiful, yeah. absolutely beautiful. It's like uh, not just the singing, but I can tell the, the 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 melody, the way in which it was is written is it's different to the Ruthenian Byzantines. Yeah. And stuff. But I mean, is it that different that you guys can't just band together? Well, that's, has that, there been any talk of that? Oh yeah, that's that's my my big pet peeve. Um, so for your listeners who don't understand, like there, it's kind of like let me can I just give them background Please. on what this. So so it's kind of here the situation in North America is this. You have a Roman Catholic diocese, let's say the Diocese of uh, La Crosse, okay? And in the Diocese of La Crosse, Wisconsin, you will have parishes that are German in background, Irish in background, French in background, Italian yeah. in background, but they're still under one Roman Catholic bishop, one Roman Catholic diocese. Um, that was also the case here in North America for all these Eastern Catholics from Hungary, Ukraine, Slovakia, Romania, and... Uh, uh, they eventually were given their own diocese around the time of the First World War. But there was so much infighting, um, you know, that the priest would have to be, if he was a priest from Ukraine, then the cantor would have to be from, like, Slovakia. Oh. And if the priest was from Hungary, then the cantor would have to be from, you know, Ukraine. So Rome just got fed up with all the infighting and I think rightfully said, enough's enough. I mean, if you're if you're from Slovakia... And if you're from Hungary, if you're from Romania, you're from Ukraine, we're just going to give each of you different dioceses. But it's the same ritual. So it's like if, you know, uh, the uh, Romans said, you know, we're going to have a diocese here in La Crosse for the German-speaking parishes, and we're going to have another diocese here in La Crosse for the Irish uh, parishes. I mean, it, it, it'd just be absurd, you know. Yeah. But that, that's what's happened to the, the, uh, the Eastern churches here. Now, fast forward a century, and here we are. And um, it, it's a perplexing situation because ritually we're we're, we're, we're the same. We come from this. We have the same ritual book. Um, mm-hmm. And our, our I teach at the seminary. I'm Ukrainian Catholic, and our some of our, our, our my, my bishop has sent a couple men there. So we we send um, pre, uh, can, priest candidates, priestly candidates from the Melkite tradition, from the Romanian tradition, mm. uh, from the Slovakian, the Byzantine Slovakian, the uh, Ukrainian tradition. They all go to the same seminary often. Um, and the, the further complicating thing is, like, we have people in the Ukrainian Catholic Church who are priests who, are, who have no connection to Ukraine genetically, like me, mm. um, and a few celibate priest friends of mine who are, you know, uh, Swedish or German in background, and they just liked it, and they, they became Ukrainian Catholic. But the Ruthenians, who are more, um, you know, anglicized, yeah. They're importing all these priests from Ukraine who can't, who don't speak English. You know, so you have you know priests from Ukraine who don't speak English serving in the yeah. in the uh, the Ruthenian church, and then you have you know white boys like me <laughs> who, who are English is their first language, and we're serving in a predominantly ethnic Ukrainian church. Yeah. So the the justification for having different jurisdictions is no longer is, is no longer real. It's just kind of left over. So I think I think the time is 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 uh, now. To really? simply just have have one jurisdiction, and if I, I'm not a bishop, I'm, yeah, just, sure, I'm sure. a holy priest. But you know, you can have if this parish has more of a of an ethnic flavor for um, you know the Ukrainian tradition, then may, let them maintain that. But yeah. you can just have one 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 seminary, and you can have one administration overseeing that. Um, so what would this church be called? Well, we just maintain the maintain the name of it. Uh, it would be like. Um, originally, they were just called, you know, Greco-Catholic, okay. you know, Greek Catholic churches. Yeah. Um, now, people get confused by that because they think when it says Greek Catholic, they think that's an ethnic moniker. Yeah. But it's not. It's like 
just because you know Saint Monica's Roman Catholic Church doesn't mean all those people are from Rome. Gotcha. Rome refers to the liturgical heritage. I see. Yeah, and that's so, helpful. Yeah. So when it says like uh, Saint Peter and Paul, uh, Greek Catholic Church. Well, that just means that it's a Catholic church, but their liturgical heritage is from the Greeks, yeah. from Constantinople. Oh, that makes sense. See, I didn't know that. That, yeah. help, that helps me. Yeah. And, but if there's another adjective in front of it, just to confuse people more, so if it says St. Peter and Paul Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church, that means that they're a Catholic church from the liturgical tradition that came out of Greek, the Greeks, and their kind of ethnic flavor is um, Ukrainian. You know, so they'll do the hopak and they'll sing, uh, you know, Christos Vos Um uh, But you, you don't see that in the Roman Catholic Church. You won't see like, you know, Saint uh, Bridget's Irish Roman Catholic Church. It just be, mm. it's just assumed. Interesting. It's stuff. just assumed. Yeah. Now it was Pope Francis who allowed Eastern priests to <laughs> to marry, right? Like, yeah. Who kind of put the anyone? You know, you don't have to get permission. Is it? Yeah. So. Uh, he 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 didn't give permission, but he I mean because it had already been happening, and it was this is an apostolic tradition. You know, it's not a teaching of the church. People right. often get confused in that. You know, how is it that the you know the the Eastern Catholics have a teaching that they're that priests can be married, and the Western Catholics, the Roman Catholics, have a teaching that priests have yeah. to be celibate? Well, it's not a teaching. It's a, it's a discipline. Yeah. Um, and so when the Eastern uh, those Eastern Orthodox uh, in 1596. Uh, came into union with Rome, they were guaranteed by papal bull that their traditions would be respected, uh, their calendar would be respected, their distinctive canonical spiritual traditions would be respected, um, and uh, that you know this church would in turn uh, acknowledge the authority of Rome, um, and uh, Rome would be involved in the selection of their bishops. All fine and good. Uh, what ended up happening is that. You fast forward 300 years or so, and uh, you get the, after the Industrial Revolution, you get people leaving uh, Eastern Europe to work in the coal mines of Pennsylvania. Um, and all of a sudden, uh, those people want to have their church because they love their, 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 their faith. Mm. They bring over their priests, and their priests bring their families. Um, and so what happened is you have cases where bishops like John Ireland says, well, you guys aren't, aren't Catholic. Mm. Uh, get out of here. And uh, that's how overnight uh, 200,000 Catholics in North America and the United States left, left the Catholic Church and joined. Yeah, can you flesh Catholics. that out for us? Because that's, that's huge. Oh, yeah. So, um, so they, they, all of these, these very devout Catholics um, who had, in their homeland, uh, suffered uh, <laughs> considerable persecution uh, for being Catholic, you know, from various directions. Orthodox, you look at the martyrs of, of uh, 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 Petlurin, you look at uh, the Calvinist influence in Hungary, and these people stayed the course. You know, they, they kept their Eastern identity, but they kept their loyalty to Rome. They come here, they're working in the coal mines, and then you get this Irish bishop, Roman Catholic bishop, who looks at them and says, you guys aren't Catholic. Mm. And they're, they're perplexed. That's going to be brutal. Yeah. So you, you can't sell, use our churches. You can't um, uh, celebrate Easter. And so these people were, were demoralized. Okay. And uh, um, after a while, they, 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 uh, the, one of their priests, Father Alexis Toth, who was from Hungary, he went and he wrote to the, the Russian Orthodox, who had a diocese out in California, um, and they had a diocese, I think, in New York, and said, we want to come under you because we, we want to be able to celebrate Easter, and we want our priests, our young men, to be ordained priests. Uh, they said, sure, you're welcome. And so then you get 200,000 people who leave the Catholic wow. Church, and they get you know, their, their, uh, their churches. So, so that, that happens. And um, by the 1920s, you had a document coming out of Rome, um, cum data furit, uh, from Pope Pius XI, which said that Eastern Catholics, if they're in the territory of North America or yeah. abroad, that's our territory. They can't be having their married priests come over and serving. So you had this this phase in uh, our church's history where um, Eastern Catholics were, were increasingly Latinized. 
So uh, the the tradition of married priesthood was suppressed. Um, Some of the priests, like in my home parish here in Carnegie, you know, we had a wonderful priest, Father Marion Kuchar with his wife and kids, and they, 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 they were heroic, you know, but they were seen as being kind of schismatics or weird, but he just kept doing what he was supposed to do, and he was a holy priest. Um, they were pushed off to the side, and so you had a generation of, of priests who um, were really a- adopting a lot of the Latin practices, and they, they kind of let slide some of the, you know, the, the Eastern uh, traditions. Um, and then you have this is during the Soviet Union now, and then you have this great thing that happens in the 60s with our patriarch, Yosef Slippy. Have you ever seen the movie The Shoes of the Fisherman? Um, with, uh, I forget the name, Peter uh, O'Toole, I think. Uh, I don't know. Shoes of the Fisherman. <laughs> and uh, it's based on his character. So he's released from the gulag after 18 years. He comes out, and there's this renaissance that this church that was dead is now alive again. And he's this Moses figure who leads his people out of captivity. And he goes, he goes to Rome, and he goes all over the world leading his people out of the shadows. You're not a people in the shadows anymore. You are the church. And he would ordain men. He would ordain married men. And he got in a lot of trouble for that, and he just kept doing it. He said, these are where well, I'm not looking at whether they're married or they're celibate. Do they love our Lord? He was a bishop. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, we, we could talk a lot about him, but uh, he was a courageous man, a Moses figure. Um, and he, when he talked, he'd have to slap his hands on the table to get feeling in them because of all the, you know, the, the, the tortures. You know, they put, anyhow, so the, the tortures that he just couldn't feel his hand anymore, so he'd be banging his hand in a conversation. That's because he wanted to feel, to pick up, you know, yeah, a glass or something. Yeah. And um, no one could really wheel him in because he was a confessor of the faith. You know, 18 years in the gulag, and y- you don't break. I mean, uh, they, they just get... What do you become? You, you know, you, they get rid of you because you're too much for them, you know? And uh, that was through John the 23rd and, and JFK that he was released. But he comes out, and uh, he starts ordaining all these married men. And so you have all these men in North America who are ordained by him, and he's a, a true confessor of the faith. Mm. Um, and and um, so all of a sudden, through the 80s, you have a number of married men, and they are just de facto present. And Rome doesn't say anything. Um, and finally, um, you know, bishops here, like Bishop Isidore in Toronto, he would send men to Ukraine to be ordained uh, in the early 90s. And then um, um, that way he was able to get around this ruling that, married men can't be ordained in North America, but everyone knew what was happening. And so good Pope Francis comes along, and in 2014, he says, you know what, this is, this this letter from 1922, cum data furit, uh, it's abolished. Mm, Good stuff. I'm glad he did that. I'm glad he did it too. It was a a good gesture on his part. Yeah. What what did, um, I forget the Latin name, Lumen Orientum, or Light of the East. Oh yeah, yeah. Yep. By John Paul II. Lumen Orientale, yeah. Orientale. Orientale Lumen. Okay. What did that do for Eastern Catholics, or what have people told you? Because you may not have been an Eastern Catholic then, but yeah. Well, it it was kind of like uh, you have like the sacrament of baptism, and then you have you know the seal of it is confirmation, right? Yeah. And it, it, it's similar to the Second Vatican Council. The Second Vatican Council really gave Eastern Catholics the the uh, the, the the courage to come out of the shadows and say, you know what. Return to your traditions, because that's what the council said to the Eastern Catholics. Don't be ashamed of your distinctive and beautiful traditions. And so you have like the the teaching in in uh, the Second Vatican Council, their letter on uh, Presbyterium um, or uh, Presbyterium uh, Ordinis, I think the name of the document is, uh, which says that the married priesthood is a sacred calling. You know, it's a, it's a holy calling. It's a, a sacra vocatio, and that was that was unbelievable that that a vatican document would say that about us you know mm. so this started with the council of the the decree of of the church to urge eastern catholics to reclaim your heritage because if that's lost we we can't we can't carry that that's your unique gift and then you uh, along comes john paul ii and john paul ii is kind of like the uh the the seal of approval on that on that urging that came out of the council and he writes Orientale Lumen and uh, it, it's, it's, uh, he uses the imagery of the body, 
you know, that the church is a body and has two lungs, and uh, you Westerners have an obligation to, to learn about the East and vice versa. Mm. And th- these two parts are not in, in contradiction, they're complementary. And so he uses the left, lo- the, the, the left lung and the right lung, the East lung and the West lung. Um, and so, so that's, that's, that's what that letter did. I think it was written in about 97, if I'm not mistaken. Um, uh, so, so yeah, he, he really did a lot for that. And he did a lot for, you know, he, he did clandestine ordinations when he was in Krakow, uh, even for, for, I'm told, from men from Ukraine. And I don't know if they were Latin right or, or Byzantine right, um, but he had a great love for uh, for Ukraine. I, I'm t- my reading indicates that his own mother was born on the on what is today Ukraine, mm. in Ternopil area, um, and so he he had a, a great love for uh, for the Eastern Catholics. Well, yeah, as a as a Polish person, he kind of straddled East and West just like that, didn't he? Yeah, linguistically and. Um, uh, culturally, yeah. he's Eastern Europe. Um, he's on the other side of the fence in terms of uh, li- liturgy, is that he was d- very definitely in the Western tradition. Um, but he had a, a broad and generous uh, heart for uh, for the traditions of yeah. the East. And, you know, that was really exemplified in 1988, you know, when the, the 1,000th anniversary of the baptism of, of, um, of, of Kiev Rus, where he himself leads a divine liturgy. Um, mm, wow! So, yeah, yeah. So I wonder if he had to learn how to celebrate that, or if yeah, he had I, known that prior to that. Yeah, moment. I know the guy who um, I met the man rather who who had to prep him for oh, that. How you know? Because what did he say that was like prepping it, John Paul II? He to said celebrate he, was the he was a great student. He was just so humble and, and <sighs> eager to learn. And I mean, if I'm the Pope of Rome and some underling is telling me how to do, I I don't know if I'd be so yeah. you know uh, docile. But he he was just like a child. He's like, I want to learn this and and. Um, that, I had no idea that John Paul II celebrated the Divine Liturgy. That's beautiful. Yeah, 1988. And uh, when he came to Ukraine in 2001, he, he con-celebrated it, uh, but he, he wasn't the main celebrant. Uh, but when people ask if Eastern Catholics are Catholic, I just, you know, if I, if I happen to have my phone handy, I take out the picture of John Paul II, you know, celebrating the Divine Liturgy. And That's out there, is it, that photo? Yeah, yeah. And then there's another one of Bishop Fulton Sheen. <laughs> I'd love to get A uh, Bishop Fulton Sheen. If you get it, can you throw that up on the screen for folks? <laughs> yeah, so you get, there's a picture of Fulton Sheen. He celebrated it too. And he was by ritual. Wow. Yeah, so you have Fulton Sheen, who is like the premier Catholic bishop of the 1950s, and the, you know, you're you're doing your thing now, in large part because of the the broadcasting giant known as Fulton Sheen, wow. and he went and celebrated the Divine Liturgy in English mm. in like 1954 down in Uniontown, Pennsylvania, at at Saint Macrina's Monastery, and um, yeah, so it was uh, he did that before the council. So, I mean, Fulton Sheen's Catholic. <laughs> yeah. Wow, that's uh, incredible. Yeah, so th- th- these two uh, Westerners, they really did a lot to kind of uh, open up the East for the, for the, rest, of, uh, for the rest of us. Um, uh, I think the, the imagery, though, to get back to your question about Orientale Lumen, it, it really lends itself, that, that bodily imagery of, uh, to help us understand the role of East and West. Mm. Um, because like any body... You can have really well developed muscles, and um, th- those muscles need to be in coordination with each other, and they th- they need to be connected. Mm. You know, and that's the ligaments, the tendons that that tendons that connect them. I in my own you know visual aids, I, I try to use that image. That's that's what the Eastern churches are, because you have, for example, like in in the Western tradition, you have this. Um, highly developed tradition of like formal worship, you know, the, the high Tridentine Mass. Um, but then you have this I, I, this this movement. I don't know if I can call it like a tradition, but it, it's definitely a, a spirit anointed movement of these Catholics who who are more charismatic Catholics. Mm-hmm. They are I think of like Ralph Martin, you know, yeah. the guys who are what a guy so in love with the, with with the Lord, and they they they, they are like. Ciborium of the Holy Spirit. Pointing know? us back to Scripture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Getting back to the basics. Yeah, yeah. And, and there's no way I'm going to look at them. And I've had people like influences in my life who come out of the charismatic mood. I'm not going to look at them and say, you're, you're not in, in conjunction, moving in, in, in symphony mm. with the Holy Spirit. No, they are. They absolutely are. But how do you join these two? Yeah. You know? And what does that look like? And, and this imagery of John Paul about understanding East and West as a body. Did you find it? 
Let me know if you throw it up there. Is it a good photo? Is it? Uh, this is what we're gonna get this. Oh, okay. We're gonna get a screen up here so we can see what he's seeing. Yeah. We're gonna get there. Yeah, yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, yeah no worries. We'll, we'll try. Maybe we can put a link in the description so people can check it out after the live stream. But, but yeah, if you go. Yeah, yes. Yeah, so so it, it's this body imagery, and so you have this kind of high church style worship, and then you have formalized and grand, and then you have a kind of I hate to use the term, but like a, a low church type of worship, which is more informal, charismatic, spirit driven. I mean, they're, they're, they're praying and I, you can't deny that they're animated mm. by the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. uh, they're, they're loyal to the church's tradition. Mm. And how do you bring the two together? And that's why I think like um, the Eastern church is so important because it's that tendon that, that connects those two well-developed uh, groups. Um, because you look at the, the high liturgical style of the Eastern churches, and you read their prayers. I should have brought. Hey, let's we can get this out. Yeah, um, you read the prayer before the thrice holy hymn. Yeah, and it is charismatic. I mean, right. you, you can't deny that it's charismatic. And you you read that, and you think, my good God Almighty. Um, <laughs> well, uh, it's just it's just while you're looking that up, it's you know like unity and uniformity and non-essentials are not the same thing and i think in a society where it feels like our church and faith is constantly under attack there is this desire to make everything uniform mm. um and in a way i think some people felt that about pope uh, francis's modu proprio i personally am not convinced that brings about church unity it might bring about a sort of uniformity or a more greater uniformity, but that doesn't mean uh, that it was good. I don't think uh, personally, right? Um, and I and I've, I say this quite a bit, but like being a faithful Catholic means not only submitting to what the church teaches authoritatively, but it also means not demanding uniformity where the church allows diversity of opinion let, let, and custom. Yeah, let's come back to that because yeah, there's sure. something I, I'd like to share from an Eastern perspective about this confusion in the church between unity and uniformity, okay. and the overreach of the office of, of the Bishop of Rome mm -hmm. that's happened historically. But I'd yeah, like to come back to that, that. Yeah. Pope Victor, if I got off topic. But okay. he, here's this connection, this using this imagery from Oriental Lumen about you know the, the, the body. And I think the Eastern Church is this, this living bridge, if you will, um, in one sense, or the Eastern Catholics, rather, kind of like a living bridge. I know my friends are going to find that offensive. We're not a bridge, you know. <laughs> but they, they, it, it is a, a, a pontiff, a living pontiff, a pontifex, you know, this bridge that, that holds the two together and holds together that movement of the spirit that is the charismatic community and the, the, the traditional last, uh, Matin last community. If you want to see how the two are held together, you just look to the Eastern or the, the Eastern Catholics. This is our liturgy. This is the prayer right before the, the Sanctus, as you would call it in the Latin tradition, uh, the Holy, Holy, Holy. And the priest prays this, It is meet and right to hymn you, to bless you, to praise you, to thank you, to worship you every, in every place of your dominion. For you are God, ineffable, inconceivable, incomprehensible, invisible, inconceivable, ever existing, and always the same. You and your only begotten Son and your Holy Spirit, you brought us from nothingness into being. And when we had fallen, you raised us up again, and you left nothing undone until you had brought us up to heaven and granted us your kingdom that is to come. For all these things we give thanks to you, to your only begotten Son, and to your Holy Spirit, for all the benefits that we have received, known and unknown, manifest mm. and hidden. We thank you also for this liturgy, which you have been pleased to accept from our hands, even though there stand before you thousands of archangels and tens of thousands of angels, the cherubim, the seraphim, six-winged, many-eyed, soaring aloft upon their wings, singing, crying, exclaiming, and saying the triumphal hymn, Holy, Holy, mm. Holy Lord of Sabaoth. I mean, does that not embody the <laughs> that charismatic That sounds like and a very articulate, spontaneous praise, like someone who's, you know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, doesn't, it doesn't seem scripted. It doesn't at all. You know? It's but glorious. It's glorious because it's alive and it's yeah. spirit-driven, Yeah, but it, it's, it's very high church. I mean, when you when yeah. you see it, I mean, it's we pray that every Sunday, and there's a time to pray it, and there's a time not to pray it, and there's um, an orientation when you're praying it. So there, there's there are rubrics involved, but those are just the banks that contain this gushing river of life. So I I think when people want to see how do you hold the two together, the charismatic and the traditional, 
you come and visit my parish, Holy Trinity Ukrainian Catholic Church in Carnegie. <laughs> and uh, there you have it. <laughs> mm. It's powerful. Unity, uniformity. This has been like a long standing problem in the church, and uh, it, it's not one that'll go away. Maybe it'll go away like five minutes after Jesus returns, you know? Um, uh, kind of, well, I don't know. Um, <laughs> So we've, we've had this before. You know, you go back into like the second century, we had a Pope Victor, and Pope Victor wanted to impose, uh, he wanted unity. I mean, all, all, all bishops of Rome, that's their charism is to, you know, to maintain Unite, the, the maintain, unity of the yeah. brethren in love. Um, and, but he confused that with uniformity, and he used his legitimate God-given office, but he used it in a way that overstepped the God-given office of the other apostolic successors, the bishops. So what it was was the, the question of the quadridecimen, the, um, the the 14th day of Nisan, so the celebration of Easter. And um, he wanted to have it a fixed date for the celebration of Easter. So I'm the Bishop of Rome, this one we're going to do it. Well, the problem is, um, well, the, the, the good thing is, is that that gives the church a semblance of order, and that's a good thing. The bad thing is, is that it violates the tradition, the valid and ancient apostolic tradition of the churches in Asia, well, what is now known as like Turkey. And so uh, they give some pushback, and there's a flurry of letters exchanged, and he says, this is what we're going to do. And uh, people want to respect his office, but the man's clearly wrong. So they say, you know, we're going to celebrate Easter on the 14th day of Nisan, mm. because this is a perpetual... Um, observance from Exodus, that that's when the Passover had to be observed, and that's when our blessed Lord was was crucified. So if that falls on a, a Friday instead of a Sunday, we're going to celebrate it on f what the Jews calculate as the 14th day of their month, Nisan, the first month in their cycle. Well, Pope Victor doesn't like that. He says it has to be on the day of the resurrection on Sunday. He's got a valid point. They write back and say, but we received this from the apostles, okay? And this is what, we just can't depart from that. It is on, our Lord was crucified on the 14th day of Nisan. We're going to stick to this. So he pushes back again. Well, no less of a figure than St. Uh, Irenaeus of Lyon, who's a Greek writing father in, in, in geographically the Western territory of Lyon, France. He comes in to the picture. And now he's a big figure because uh, he's a big daddy of the big daddies because uh, he was respected for his uh, defense of the Orthodox faith and his, his re you know, refutation against the heresies of, of uh, the Gnostics. But even more so, he was a disciple of St. Polycarp, who was a disciple of John the Divine, the apostle of our Lord, the beloved one who sat at our Lord's breast and leaned on it um, at the Last Supper. Mm. And Irenaeus writes to him and says, Victor, buddy, Polycarp was my mentor. And Polycarp got this tradition from John. And these guys in Asia have a valid point. They got this from the apostles. Don't confuse uniformity with unity. This is Irenaeus speaking yeah. to Pope Victor. Yeah, yeah. And then the bishop, the patriarch, I think Dionysius of Alexandria in Egypt, you know, where our Lord went and as a child with Mary and Joseph, he writes the same thing. They, they weren't writing to each other, yeah, uh, Dionysius yeah. and Victor. You know, he writes and says, back down, buddy. And so Victor takes his tail and kind of, you know, tucks it away, okay. and he backtracks humbly. Good. You know, and so that's an example of when there's this, uh, the, the role of brother bishops in the, the, the college of, of the apostles, and out of charity and, and love for their brother, and for love of the unity of the church and for legitimate diversity, not the diversity that we hear of, you know, today on in, among the pagans, but a legitimate diversity of valuing and esteeming the God-given gifts that the other has, uh, Victor backs down. And uh, since then, we've always had varying dates of, of, uh, of Easter. The Syriac Christians have a different calculation. You know, the, the Alexandrians... Uh, they were different from the, the Christians in Asia Minor. They said, well, we're not going to base the celebration of our Lord's resurrection on the, the calendar of the Jews, you know. Um, so uh, 
so anyhow, and then Nicaea gives a different calculation. And that's the one we follow, um, the, the, the calculation of Easter that came out of Nicaea in the year 325. So, so this is just an example of how there has been overreach mm -hmm. from the Bishop of Rome and how in charity and love, other bishops like St. Paul, who corrected Peter, corrected the Pope in Rome. Um, it seems like we had a stretch of orthodox good popes, Pope Paul VI, you know, John Paul II, Benedict, who I think were keeping a lid on a lot of the crazy stuff that seems to be exploding all over the church right now. But maybe that led to a sort of ultramontanism. There was a lot of yep. confusion because of all the craziness of the 60s and the reforms of the Second Vatican Council. So we looked to Rome to clarify the confusion in our parishes. Uh, whereas now it seems like we look to our parish priests to try to clarify the confusion coming out of Rome. How might this current pontificate lead to the purification of our understanding as it pertains to the papacy? Matt, that's an excellent question. And I, I think some people are might be afraid to answer that directly. Uh, but, but I'm not. Let's go at it. <laughs> you know, I want to answer that from the experience of the Ukrainian Catholic Church. The short answer is it's going to give us a bare bones, um, enlivened, and purified, vibrant faith. God is permitting this so that we will cleave to him. And, and here's what I mean. We were faithful to Rome, and we always will be faithful to Rome. Um, people have endured enormous suffering, as I explained earlier, not for heavy dogmatic questions, you know, deny Jesus Christ. It was deny union with a bishop in Rome who doesn't even really know about you, you know, to the parish priest. You know, what, does the, what does Pope Pius XII know about you in, in this little village in the Carpathian Mountains? I won't do it. I will be faithful to him. So we've been faithful to him. You know, there have been no other Roman Catholic martyrs for the question of unity with Peter in the 20th century. Uh, well, I should I should back up. The Chinese have been faithful. The last time the the the, the Romans um, had a had martyrs for the question of church unity, uh, off the top of my head, I might be wrong, but I mean I think of the Reformation. I think of you know Thomas More and John mm -hmm. Fisher. Um, we've given that, and we we've we've demonstrated the love in our heart for the union union of the church through the blood in our veins, and that blood's been spilled in everywhere from Ukraine through to Vladivostok. What I'm getting at is this, is that in the midst of those bitter years, uh, there was a policy from Rome called Ostpolitik, which, uh, for all, to shorten it, allowed us to die out gradually. Let's, let's give them a minimal amount of existence, but we're going to be in a long war with the communists, and let's just make them happy so that more difficulties don't befall our people. And we're going to basically ignore the rights of the persecuted Eastern Catholics in the Iron Curtain. And, you know, we'll throw them a few crumbs here and there uh, to keep them going. And our people knew that, that Rome wasn't always speaking up for us. And still, despite that neglect, our people were still loyal. So we didn't have, um, you know, a government to protect us. We didn't have a hierarchy. They were all martyred or, or taken away and became confessors. So our people were without a hierarchy. They had priests who roamed in the forests at night. You know, if you want, like my wife was baptized by a priest who came in uh, dressed as a doctor uh, at midnight. They pulled the curtains around, uh, baptized her and he got his medical bag and his medical coat and he left again and that's how a generation of people kept their faith and um so i think those people have something to say now about how much they love peter and how much they love the church and their voice needs to be heard and so what needs to be said is is this is that they survived because although they were, they had no government to protect them, they had no church structure to protect them, and they, they didn't have, um, at all times, I have to admit it, the Vatican that protected them. They had to play with the hand they were dealt, 
and the hand they were dealt with was just a radical mm, reliance dependence on Jesus Christ alone. And you know what? It's the best thing that happened to our church wow. because out of that, yeah. we came with a great renaissance. And our church came out of the collapse of the Soviet Union like a roaring lion. We came out of there like a champ, like Daniel out of the lion's uh, den. And so I say this to, to your listeners, is that if you feel you've been betrayed by um, the church, the men in the church, you're not betrayed by Christ's mystical body, but the men who are in positions of authority in the church, priests, bishops, cardinals, popes, cardinals and popes are, are bishops, uh, well, not all cardinals, but the pope's always a bishop, then take the example of the Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church. We place not our trust in the princes of men. That's where we look. So if you're feeling let down. Wow. We've been through this is kind of what you're saying. We've look been to here us. We and we came out of it better than yeah. we went into it. Uh, and so I think that that's my first comment. Second comment, more succinct, is uh, um, I think, in fact, I, I, I'm convinced that for many of us, the heavy lifting of divine faith because faith is an, is an act of the will. You respond to God's invitation. That heavy lifting of faith was passed off to the structure of a smooth-running church. You know, this is what Pope John Paul II has taught, and we've had like a hundred years of great popes, so I, I just go along with it. Like, he, he's done all, the, and he can't be wrong, he's done all this heavy lifting well, I, I'm just going along with it. That's that's awesome, but this is a that that's like the kid in class who's just kind of copying what the smart kid beside him said, and the teacher doesn't want that. The teacher wants you to assimilate to, to assimilate imbibe, it, yeah. to work through the math problem so that you have, as you said, assimilate. It's become part and parcel with you, and if if you need to to check, then obviously you check with this person beside you who who's been through the grade before and you know it's a tutor sitting beside you yeah and mm. this is the role of the church the church is a, a mater a teacher a mother um but she's not a substitute for faith amen that's really that's really great yeah so in a way perhaps some of us are using this as an excuse to do the hard work it's easier to complain about the chaos in the church and the the poor leadership of some but it's like, brother, sister, you have the catechism of the Catholic Church. You have the scriptures. You know, get to work. You have the writings of the saints. What's your excuse exactly for not being holy? And don't you dare point to Pope Francis or this bishop or this priest. Right, right. right. So the, the, um, the, I think our great temptation now that uh, God has set everything up for the moment of greatness. This is our moment of glory. You know, the, the time and the circumstances that we've been given, these are the vessels that God has provided into which we can pour our lives because we're going to flow through this vessel as, 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 as flames, as living water, as, as saints. And um, uh, this is why we're here. This is our moment of glory. Um, and there's the temptation, however, to delay, defer, to procrastinate that action by debate and discussion. The time for debate and discussion is over. We know what's required of us, that we are to become a holy nation, you know, uh, a nation of priests for our God. So let's stop complaining. Let's get down to the work that needs to be done. Our world is thirsting for saints, and this is our day. Glory to Jesus Christ. Glory forever. We're going to take a two-minute break. We're going to come back. I'm going to have a beer. You don't have to. <laughs> and we're going to take some questions for those in the live chat. Sound good? Sounds good. Great. All right, I want to say thank you to Ethos Logos Investments for supporting this show, elinvestments.net slash pints. I guess when I was a bit younger, I thought that investing was something that only rich people did or old people did or rich old people did. I didn't realize it was something that I should be looking into as well. And when I began looking into it, I realized I don't want to invest in companies that are doing immoral things. 
And that's where Ethos Logos Investments comes in. They were founded to work with individuals and institutions within the United States that seek to infuse their morals into their investment portfolio, with portfolios that adhere to the US Conference of Catholic Bishops Responsible Investing Guidelines. You can be sure that you aren't profiting from intrinsic evils like abortion, embryonic stem cell research, pornography, or human trafficking. Please go check them out. Ethos Logos Investments is what they're called, elinvestments.net slash pints. There's a link in the description below. elinvestments.net slash pints. For employers, they offer socially responsible and Catholic 401k and 403b options as well. So yeah, go check them out, elinvestments.net slash pints. Securities offered through Securities America Inc., member FINRA SIPC. Ethos Logos Investments and Securities America are separate entities. Advisory services offered through Securities America Advisors Incorporated. Yes. The second group I want to thank is Hallow. Hallo, H-A-L-L-O-W dot com slash Matt Frad. Hallo dot com slash Matt Frad. Hallow is a fantastic app that will help you to pray and meditate. It's not like new age mindfulness apps that lead into wrong ways of thinking. This is 100% Catholic and it's super sophisticated. If you go to hallow.com slash Matt Frad and sign up there, you'll get a few months for free before deciding if you want to pay a minimal amount every month to have access to their entire app. Now you can download the app right now and you'll get access to certain things for free. So be sure to check that out if you just want to, you know, play around with it and see what they have to offer. But if you want access to everything that they have, like sleep stories and Bible studies and all sorts of beautiful things like that, you, you, you have to pay a certain amount every month to get access to that. If you want access to everything for a few months, just go to hallow.com slash Matt Frad, hallow.com slash Matt Frad and sign up there. Thanks. back we're good we're good we're good all right uh thanks everybody for being here this is this has been remarkable father um we're going to take some questions from those in the live chat should they wish to ask them benjamin handelman said he has his question ready all right benjamin so <laughs> Let's see here. Feel free to send them on in if you if you at Pints with Aquinas, so I'll probably be able to see them a little better. Also, yeah. Earlier, earlier we, we had a super chat, chat that was Ooh. asking um, if you can become a if you can be married and then be ordained in the Eastern Rite and then switch rites. Somebody wanted to know. Can you be yeah? What is that? Married yeah. in the Eastern Rite. Married and then become ordained in the Eastern Rite and then switch to the. Western, right? No. Ah, no. <laughs> That's a bit sneaky, isn't no, it? No, no. Doesn't yeah. work that way. Yeah. Now, you, you can uh, become by ritual. So we have a number of uh, uh, priests, myself included. Um, you know, you're married. You're, you're ordained in the uh, in the Greek Catholic Church, the Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church, for example. And um, and then uh, you're you need to support your family. Uh, so you uh, you you uh, in addition to your parish ministry, you will. Um, often teach or um, uh, you'll, you'll receive by ritual faculties, um, you know, at, at the, the good graces of, of Rome, goes through the Eastern Congregation, and, uh, and the good graces of the local Roman Catholic bishop, um, and then you serve in a, in a hospital as a chaplain. Um, so that's, that, that does happen. You can receive by ritual faculties to, uh, you know, to help out at, at hospitals and whatnot. 
Benjamin Handelman. Thank you for your $20 super chat, Benjamin. You didn't have to do that, mate. Thanks a lot. He says, how does Sharon, how do I see your last name? Mm, Sharon. How, how does Father Sharon have so much time to run an amazing parish, raise children, play chess? He must know you, this guy. Do you play chess? I do. Teach and do a better job of evangelizing Derek than I ever could. He's friends with Derek. Benjamin. Really inspiring. Would love to meet him. Well, Benjamin, he's coming up soon. So maybe you you can come down. I'd like to meet him. It's, it's to answer the question, especially with such a nice compliment. The least you can do is drive back down. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, let me uh, parlay here with a uh, counter move. Uh, the answer to the question is is my wife. I mean, if it weren't for my wife, sacrifices so much, and uh, she supports me. And um, uh, my my marriage is like the soil that the vocation of of my priestly vocation has really uh, blossomed in. And uh, uh, so I, I can do all those things because my wife uh, prays for me. She keeps me sane. She keeps the house running. She keeps everything going. And she's in the background and she gets uh, none of the credit. But uh, um, it's all because of God's grace that he's really given to me through my, my wife, Helena. Uh, Elijah asks, how do Byzantine Catholics understand the filioque? Are you bound to say it the way the Council of Florence does? Yeah, so... If, Good question. Uh, you know, we're not bound to say the, the filioque in my in the Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church. Um, vast majority of our parishes uh, do not say the filioque, and uh, uh, that could be a very very long dis- discussion. <laughs> but uh, I'll just I'll just yeah. keep it at that. So uh, we sure. we don't say the filioque, but you know we believe that there is a, an orthodox, i.e., you know, proper and accurate. Uh, you know, uh, way of, of saying the filioque. You know, there's nothing there's nothing heretical about uh, saying the filioque as as Rome understands it. Um, but uh, both th- there is an unorthodox way of uh, saying the filioque, and there is an unorthodox way of omitting the filioque. Um, so we uh, we believe in the the orthodox way of of uh, omitting the the, the filioque. Small o orthodox way of, of of believing it. That's a very it can get very complicated, and I don't want to uh, get into too many technicalities for your 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 listeners. Okay, Benjamin sends another question, and he says, "Hospital and nursing home chaplain, pres- professor at Biz- he, This guy really likes you, Benjamin. Just calm down. I mean, just hide the affection you clearly have for this man. <laughs> On the board of a Catholic school and camping ministry, and actually runs to okay, Benjamin. How do you know Father Sharon? That's what I want to know. He lives in well, he was in Benjamin. California. He's now in Arizona. Benjamin, you ever heard this guy. of? So he's ben, awesome. He's terrific. Benjamin is a convert to the faith from yeah. Protestantism. Him and I started a little apostolate with another guy. Um, it's called Cross the Tiber. Dot com. And if someone's here today and you are considering Catholicism, you can go to crossthetiber.com and join a small group, a small video chat group. And that's how Derek kind of got connected. He heard about it on Pints with Aquinas. He was in touch yeah. with these guys. Benjamin and him are well, chatting. To, to answer his question, uh, you know, two, two priests that really models to me, Father Jay Donahue, Father uh, Joe Freedy in Pittsburgh. And, oh, what a guy. Uh, they, um, th- they taught me that through their example that you know, you can you can do things on your own, or you can uh, do things with others. And when you do things with others, things happen. And so, if God has placed in your heart a desire to do something that's good, true, and holy, then don't wait for the optimal uh, circumstances to fall into place. God, if God gives you the desire, He's going to give you the, uh, the, the 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 opportunity and the circumstances to fulfill it and to bring it to completion. And so, you find people of like mind who also have the same inspiration. And you pray together, and you just do it. So whether it's you know the South Hills Catholic Academy in Pittsburgh, or whether it's Dry Bones Ministry with camping, or whether it's you know whatever is you you pray together. You find people of like mind, and you just do the good. I mean, has has there been moments in your marriage where you, without discounting the the credibility and beauty of being a married priest, have there been times in your priesthood where you're like, wow, this this would be easier if I weren't married? I, I see the I see the wisdom in a celibate priesthood. Uh, well, um, I wouldn't be able. I, I just can't imagine being a priest in any other way it's like asking a you know a, a, a fish what's it like to be out of water he just he wouldn't be able to compare it to anything but um in terms of you know time you know you can i think there's more time in that regard 
Well, here's an example. It should, let's say it's your daughter's birthday and you're at a party and a parishioner calls you sick from the hospital and they would like the uh, yeah, you extreme gotta go. function. You got to go. Where's your loyalty? Where does your loyalty lie at that you, point? You got to go. Yeah. And like my daughter Daria, she goes to uh, Olsh in Pittsburgh. Um, shout out to Olsh and uh, everyone there. But uh, I've, I've missed the vast majority of her soccer games this year because it's in the evening. And in the evening is when most priests are free for meetings and whatnot. And uh, so it, it's it's one of the uh, the unfortunate drawbacks of of a married priesthood is that uh, family life is often neglected. And has that been like a struggle? Is that yeah? I'm sure, it, it's got to be. Yeah, hard. it's not easy. And I'm, I'm not. I don't have a great track record. So I um, do. You find that. Uh, having brother priests who are also married to be able to process this stuff with because it's a very unique situation that you're in yeah yeah i they, they we understand one another and we, we get to talk and uh um that's helpful that's helpful but i mean it, it it's like any married man though is that uh, there are guys who have more demanding jobs than i do mm. i think of the president of the united states they've all been married you know i love that that's how you gotta go that's the next guy up on the <laughs> rung who's got who's got a more demanding job than <laughs> yeah. me yeah. so you have you have guys like matt frad or uh, president <laughs> of the united states and uh, you know they have great demands but you you have to have boundaries you if you have no boundaries then you're 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 done you're done so uh um just the way it is which know. is another reason lay involvement is helpful mm. i'm sure when you have people come to the parish and they suggest something sometimes yeah. you must be like well yeah do you want to run it because yes. <laughs> one, one, one good piece of advice that i received and i try to pass it on to uh, others and i try to do it for myself is when these impositions come upon me uh are they asking me to do something that um they can do themselves never do for another what he can do for himself mm. um if it's something they they uh they want then I, I will, you know, tell them uh, I can't do that. If it's something they need, then I, I'm there for them. We have a super chat from Ash Awesome. He says, are Romans allowed to attend Byzantine seminary or vice versa without needing permission from the ordinary or do they require permission? Yeah, you can attend a Byzantine seminary to take classes, but you cannot attend a Byzantine seminary uh, as a seminarian or a candidate for priestly formation without uh, being sponsored by a bishop. Uh, the American Cristero says, has the sack of Constantinople or the massacre of the Latin Quarter come up yet? That seems inevitable in East-West discourse, sadly. Or do Byzantines leave the hatchet buried? Tell, for those who are maybe not aware, could you just sort of give a little background context before addressing that yeah uh, basically there was a division between east east and west began to separate culturally um linguistically um on every front from the time of the sacking of rome in uh, the early fifth century um and onwards and that was kind of formalized in a in a in a political schism in 1054, mm -hmm. um, and that was between Cardinal Humbert and uh, Michael uh, uh, Um That really didn't s seep down to the level of the people, however, um, because you had Latins living in Constantinople and you had Greeks living in Italy, and there's intercommunion. Um, however, you know that. That raw hatred and division uh, came in in, uh, in 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 the sacking of Constantinople by the Latin Crusaders, who were excommunicated by the Pope for for what they did, uh, and the desecration of the holy places and the things they did in Hagia Sophia. Yeah. And when that happened, that's when there was a palpable schism. It wasn't just political and ideological; it was real and it was personal. Um, and uh, um, that for us however has been sublimated by christ's command to forgive and uh we we see no virtue um in holding on to the the sins of our co-religionists from 800 years ago we do see uh, a value in forgiving as christ forgives and uh living out uh the christian commandment to love one another here and now so uh i don't know of any parishioners to answer the question here i don't know of any parishioners who are still embittered by the sacking of their mother church uh in tw in the in the 1200s 
Thanks. Uh, Sophia Sharon. Oh, my daughter. Hi, Sophia. <laughs> my daughter. Your lovely daughter. It says, should traditional Catholics seek shelter in the Byzantine church if they don't think they're being well ministered to in their parish? This yeah. is this is a, this is a good question. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. I think so because it's All the right. one. It, it's it's the. It, we are Catholics, whether you're of the Cyril Malabar tradition, the Maronite tradition, the Byzantine tradition, the Catholic tradition. You have an obligation to to worship the Lord your God, and uh, you you have an obligation to do so in in a, a sacramental manner. You know, you, you, we need the sacraments like plants need water. Um, and if you find yourself in a situation where um, you, you have a, a parish or a pastor who isn't respecting the apostolic tradition that's been handed down to them, yeah. and going to Sunday liturgy, mass, whatever, means that you come home angry and your kids are confused because uh, Father is teaching something that's heretical and nothing's being done about it and there's no reverence for the Eucharist, then then find a home, whether it's Byzantine, Maronite, you know, a traditional Latin Mass, but find a home where you come out of those doors and you're ready to take on the world. You've been fed mm. with the bread of immortality and you are on fire so uh it doesn't matter where the tradition is necessarily um if if your own tradition is not feeding you but you have to you know maintain communion with the one holy catholic and apostolic church our obligation isn't first and foremost to the tradition in which we were born our obligation is to be faithful to jesus christ and to live a sacramental life and ideally you know ideally it's going to be in your own liturgical tradition yeah. um but if it's not possible for you to do that then um, the, the the Lord understands, and he, He's given us twenty one different <laughs> different spiritual uh, traditions in which we can live that out. Uh, you said that it's ideally in your own sacramental tradition. I mean, I, I think I understand what you mean, but why? Why ideally? Yeah. Why not just sort of seek what what? Uh, I mean, Scott Doctor Hahn talked about this, and when I had him on the show, he said, you know, it's it's one thing to 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 seek out a boutique coffee shop and get the most sort of exotic coffee, but we shouldn't really be doing that with the liturgy. That's not what you're saying. Right. But, you know, there is that kind of temptation. Well, I'm kind of bored with this. I'm going to go to this and I'm kind of bored with that. So it kind of escalates to something a little bit more uh, whatever. Yeah. I'll, I'll answer the question with an analogy. You know, if you don't um, fight the barbarians at the gates, then you'll be fighting the barbarians at your front door. And if you don't fight them at your front door, you'll be fighting them in your bedroom. Um, mm. better to fight the barbarians at the gates. And so if, if you find yourself um, at the gates and uh, they're, they're, let's say you're, you're a Maronite Catholic and there's an attack on your tradition, um, if you forsake that and you, you, you jump ship somewhere else, then well, once your own tradition's eviscerated, don't think that they're going to be satiated with that and they're going to stop. They're just going to keep moving on. So... Um, uh, that that's why I say is is if you have uh, the uh, the wherewithal and a, a you know a, a community of people who are willing to to support you, then you know stand your ground and uh, and and become saints, become saints together, and uh, um, you know fight for those those devotions and those traditions that uh, have come down to us from the apostles. Um, but if if you just are in a situation where that's not possible. Um, and you're going to be depleted and alone, right. then go to a community that it has has a lively uh, liturgical life and where people will love you. That's a good answer. Uh, Folifus says, Father, can you explain the schism situation going on with the Orthodox in Ukraine and how, if, it's affecting the Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church? Yeah, it, it really doesn't affect us too, too much. Uh, for your listeners, the situation is this, is that the, the Russian um, Orthodox Church and the Russian state, uh, going back centuries, more than 500 years, um, have been, they, they work in, in concert. Mm -hmm. um, and so y you see that during the Soviet Union, is that what, what, what the, uh, the KGB wanted, the, the church used its office uh, the Russian Orthodox Church used its office to kind of sacralize and sanctify um, the the uh, the secular ambitions of of Moscow, and so that was just a continuation of what Peter the Great did in Catherine, in that they used the church to uh, to to advance uh, their geopolitical 
uh, strategies for their sphere of influence uh, from the Arctic Ocean down to the, the Black Sea and, and abroad. And so um, this has been going on for years. So although Ukraine uh, was Christian before what is now called Russia, Novgorod, Moscow, th those were the hinterlands. Th th there was no civilization there. Uh, there was civilization in Kiev in the 10th century. There was nothing in Moscow. There was no Moscow. And so uh, this church develops its own tradition, the, the church uh, in, in Ukraine. And uh, Ukraine is sacked by the Mongols in the 1200s. Moscow ascends, becomes very powerful, and uh, has this rulership over um, hegemony over Ukraine. And they keep that because the Ukrainian church provides them with lots of vocations. Um, and this stays this way until like two years ago. So uh, there's no question that the Ukrainian church is a, is a mature uh, apostolic uh, church that that is in communion with the the tradition that came down to us from the apostles. Moscow has a vested interest in making sure that that never happens because most of Moscow, about forty percent of Moscow's priests, the Russian Orthodox priests, come from Ukraine. At least that was the statistic mm -hmm. about ten years ago. And to say nothing of the financial windfall that comes with having parishes in Ukraine, so. The Ukrainian Orthodox, uh, they turn to uh, Greece, the Patriarch of Constantinople, and say, we received the faith from you in 988, and we've been in communion with you since 988, and we think that uh, we're mature enough to be a self-governing church, that we can appoint our own bishops and erect our own monasteries and things like that. Uh, do you think so as well? And the Patriarch of Constantinople writes back and says, yes, I think mm -hmm. you're, after a thousand years, uh, it's high time, and I recognize that, that you're a self-ruling church, and he gives them something called the Tomos. Well, Moscow is infuriated, and uh, there is now a schism mm. within Orthodoxy is between the Russians and the Greeks. Um, so when people say, I belong to the Orthodox Church, I say, which one? <laughs> you know, is, is it the, uh, the Russian Church or the Greek Church or, or what have you? Uh, so that's kind of the background on it, and uh, th they're they're doing they're doing uh, the work of the gospel in Ukraine because they're they're uniting the Orthodox, and many many Orthodox Russian Orthodox are leaving, and joining the the now recognized Ukrainian Orthodox Church, and our relationship of, with our our patriarch with their Metropolitan is very good. The Ukrainian Catholics have a good relationship with the Ukrainian Orthodox in Ukraine. Um, uh, we've forgiven the, the the Russian Orthodox from Moscow for what they did to us in the 1946. They suppressed us and liquidated us. Uh, that's not reciprocated. They don't recognize that they've done anything wrong. So. Mm. Um, I'm going to give you a chance to respond to St. Thomas Aquinas. You uh -oh. ready? This will be your said contra. This will be your... This You need to show him why he's wrong here. Um, and it has to do with infants receiving Eucharist. So obviously, as Catholics, we now know, we know that infants can receive Eucharist. Aquinas says no. So this is in the Tershapars, question 80, article 9. The third objection, so what he wants to respond to, you're familiar with the Summa, I'm sure, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, Further, among those that lack the use of reason are children, the most innocent of all. But this sacrament is not given to children, therefore much less should it be given to others deprived of the use of reason. Aquinas says in response to this, the same reason holds good of newly born children as of the insane who never had the use of reason. So Aquinas is going to say, if you've never had the use of reason, you shouldn't be receiving the Eucharist because you're not kind of affirming what it is and knowing what you're receiving. <clears throat> Consequently, the sacred <coughs> excuse me, mysteries are not to be given to children. Although certain Greeks do the contrary, because Dionysius says... That Holy Communion is to be given to them who are baptized, not understanding that Dionysius is speaking there of the baptism of adults, nor do they suffer any loss of life from the fact of our Lord, saying, John 6, 54, except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you shall have no life in you, because, as Augustine writes to Boniface, that every one of the faithful becomes a partaker, that is spiritually, of the body and blood of our Lord when he is made a member of Christ's body and baptism. But when children once begin to have some use of reason so as to be able to conceive some devotion for the sacrament, then it can be given them. Obviously, you 
administer Eucharist to babies. Yep. Peter Frad, my son, uh, I, I thought it was beautiful. There was a time in his life where the only two things he received was breast milk and Eucharist. Mm. And I once heard a Byzantine priest say, I, I don't wait for my children to explain nutrition to me before I feed mm-hmm. feed them, and I don't need them to know, understand the Eucharist before yeah. I administer to them. But what, what do you say to, to, to that? I say, well, th- thank you for the honest question. And uh, uh, historically, we see that there are great saints who disagreed with each other. We see, you know, Saint Cyprian of Carthage and Saint Pope Saint Stephen disagreed. Uh, we see, you know, cases in the Gospel of you know Saint Paul uh, disagreeing with. Uh, uh, with some of the other apostles, and uh, you know, n- numerous cases in church history of of good men who hold to different views, mm-hmm. and uh, you know, I happen to disagree with Thomas Aquinas' uh, teaching on uh, his opinion on the Immaculate Conception as well. Yes. So um, nicely played. <laughs> so uh, uh, on this question, I I disagree. Although I I love Saint Thomas, but I think on this, you know, as a human, he you know, God alone is perfect. Yep. And uh, on this area, he was, I think, off. And the reason is because Jesus said, let the little children come to me. Hmm. And to me, that's enough. If Jesus says, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, uh, then... Uh, they don't have to understand who he is before coming to him in the right. Gospels. Yeah. And, and uh, the, the, uh, that, that suffices it right there. Uh, but if I wanted to add to it, <laughs> I, w- I would also say that, you know, uh, when any one of us understands baptism, when any one of us understands uh, mm-hmm. any of the the mysteries, then y- you'd be the first to approach because I I don't dare to say that I fully understand the Eucharist. I, I don't dare to say that I fully understand how I'm regenerated and mm. and and grafted to Christ in the waters of baptism. Yeah. I don't dare to understand how a sinful man um, like Cardinal McCarrick when he consecrates the bread, that that still becomes the body of Christ. I'm not going to pretend to say, yeah, I understand that. Frankly, I don't. It, 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 it transcends my mind. So if we wait for the day when we can understand the, the sacred mysteries of God before we give our assent to them, then um, it, it, it's not the gospel or the mysteries I believe in, it's my mind. Mm. And... Uh, it uh, the the effectiveness and the power um, and the entrance into the mysteries does not is not contingent upon uh, my rationality. It, it's uh, no infant. If we if we follow that to its logical conclusion, no infant will ever be baptized because no infant understands understands baptism i agree with everything you're saying yeah um but uh, i mean i don't want to misrepresent aquinas he, he would never say you have to understand a sacrament completely i suppose he would say there needs to be some acceptance of what this thing is right um but to your point i mean thomas isn't the magisterium no individual saint is the magisterium that's right. why we have the magisterium we don't have to go uh, on everything a particular holy or educated person had to say thank god if you did then you'd be stuck in this awful position of having to scour through the pages of the many holy and learned men yeah. for the last 2,000 years to try to get your theology straight, and even then you wouldn't be sure that you did. Right. I, I, I would also say, absolutely absolutely right, I would also point to um, the experience of the early church, you know, because, you know, it's one thing for me to paint a picture of uh, what my parents are like um, from the stories they tell me, yeah. but it's another thing to get... Um, the story from their parents, you know, yeah. and for my grandparents to tell me what my mom and dad were like when they were kids. And so if we want to know about the, the this issue of communion with children, then uh, we don't look just to the 13th century or just to the 7th century, but we go to like the 4th century, the 5th century, read the writings of St. Cyril of Jerusalem, who happened to know a thing or two about uh, this, being the bishop of Jerusalem in the 4th century. And uh, in his catechetical writings, he speaks about you know, communion with infants. And so if, if the Church of Antiquity and the Holy Land yeah. was maintaining that tradition v- much closer to the apostles than we are, I, I think there's something to be, uh, to be said about that. Mm. If there's any questions that come up, let me know. I, my, my computer sounded like it was about to take off into flight, into orbit. Have you ever tried to write icons? No. 
No, I couldn't write. I, a ca- I can't help but think that sometimes saying write icons just sounds pretentious. Like when people get really upset about me saying paint, no one's ever got really upset yeah. about me saying painting, but I'm just going to say paint. Yeah. Why is that? Why do you say write an icon? Because I, of the Gospels. You, you, all right. You, 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 you don't paint the Bible. You know, you, you don't paint copies of the Bible. You write copies of the Bible, or you you don't have. But this you, is the gospel through paint. Yeah. So so the the, I mean, I'm I'm with you. I don't get upset when someone says you know paint icons. It's kind of like the the frustrated uh, barista who uh, <laughs> someone comes in and says, "Give me a coffee." You know, yeah, like, yeah, oh. yeah. Or an espresso. Yeah, yeah. Give me espresso, please. <laughs> um, give me a coffee. Yeah. You know? And she's, oh, I don't have coffee here. Yeah. Uh, well, it's it's the same with with some. People who are a little more pretentious. It's not right icons. It's paint. Um, but the 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 precise origin of this is that uh, we're we're writing a visual gospel. It's a gospel painted, depicted, uh, not in letters, but in in uh, form, in 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 line and color. Can you tell us a little bit about some of the symbolism that maybe um, you know someone looks at and they don't immediately get when it comes to icons? Uh, yeah, so you have up here uh, in Greek. Will this help if he points this at the... Yeah, I'll point the camera again. So again. All right, we'll point the so camera. I'll... Now, what I was thinking in particular, too, was, you know, you hear the, the, the long, thin nose and the larger ears, the small mouth, these sorts of things. When someone explained that to me, I found that very... This is my... Um... You found my soft underbelly because I ne- I've never <laughs> taken, in my eight years of seminary, I've n- I never had the, uh, the blessing of taking even one course in iconography. My wife knows more about iconography mm. than I do. So this is my soft underbelly. Okay. So well, I, I want to keep pressing. I welcome any correction from your, uh, from your audience. <laughs> you will get it, I'm sure. Don't worry. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so typically, uh, you know, you have um, uh, you know, you're different... Yeah, icons are not um, uh, meant to be historical representations of of the the person depicted there. Um, they're they're windows into heaven, and through the uh, the 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 use of symbol, uh, we we get an understanding of the meaning behind uh, the, the 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 form and the color and the line. So, for example, you'll often have depictions of uh the christ child with a large head mm. you know people think what has he got hydrocephaly or something like that and no it's just that that's a symbol of he's full of wisdom mm. so you have the depictions of the christ child meaning he's full of wisdom that's he, why i have a large forehead <laughs> <laughs> that's from banging your head on the on ladder the that yeah. too um and the uh you'll often have uh you know a book open that means christ the divine teacher you know he's teaching uh, like in this icon, we see that the, this here, the book is open. Um, he's teaching. Y- you really got to be scared when you have an icon of Christ when the book's closed, because that means judgment. Mm, everything's been really? said. Everything's been done. The book is closed now, and he's here as the just judge. Um, so, so uh, that's here, interesting. Here we have it as it's open. You know, it's to be read still. Um, maybe you know, pages stuff could still be written. I find this fascinating too. That in in every correct me if I'm wrong, but in every other halo, you don't have writing, right? But you have it within with Christ. You do. You do. And what and what and what does that mean? Yeah, it's the o on. It's the uh, I, the one who is. You know, mm. it's uh, um, the uh, Exodus uh, three fourteen. Yeah. You know, I am who am. Um, so this is the this harkens back to. Um, Thanks, Neil. You know, Christ uh, appearing to to Moses in the bush. You know, because all of these right. types of the Old Testament are types preparing us for the the, the ultimate antitype, Christ Himself. Mm. And so, the when, when Christ says "Ego in me," the the one who is, uh, I am who am. Uh, this is this is spoken to Moses, and it's fulfilled. You know, in all these I am statements in John's Gospel. Uh, this is the God who appeared to Moses, and He's now walking among you. Uh, and in our iconography, we we reiterate, reiterate that that uh, I am. Mm-hmm. He's the one who is the Oon. And over here we have um, this icon might not be entirely uh, ac- entirely canonical, sure, because um, uh, usually the exterior vestige of Christ is is blue. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, underneath it'll be um, red. red. 
Um, and uh, with the Theotokos, it's the other way it's around. It's the other way around, yeah. So do you have any icons here? Uh, not um, of the Theotokos, not in this room. Outside yeah. I do. Okay, you're not a real... Uh, not a real Catholic. Not a real Catholic That's anymore. Right. So your, your book is, your, your name is etched out of the book of oh, the dear. living. Uh, Please God, no. You know, but so the, the red refers to humanity. Uh, the blood of man, oh. and so that that's why that's there. Oh, okay. And then um, uh, the blue, uh, the, the blue is divinity. Oh, okay. And um, now with Mary, it's the reverse because she is human, but within her she carried hmm. divinity, the divinity of Christ, and that's why her um, her 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 clothing will be that the the blue will be underneath it. It's referring hmm. to Christ. Uh, within her humanity. Beautiful stuff. Uh, up here, the IC and the XC refers to, uh, it's the Greek abbreviation, Jesus Christ. You know, Matt, your your, your initials are uh, MF, mm -hmm. um, and uh, that can have a really bad meaning. It uh, can. <laughs> People have pointed <laughs> but, that out. <laughs> but uh, my, my, mine is JC, in case you know. Ah, uh, yes, well done. Uh, uh, but the, the thing here is the Greeks <laughs> didn't do that. They took the first two letters of your name, and of your first, first name? and last of each name, uh, is that right? Yeah, yeah, the first yeah. and last of your first name and the first and last letter in your last name, and that was their abbreviation. So here you have Isus, uh, so they just drop the two middle letters and they use the first one and the last name, that's where you get the IC. And for Christos, you take the X and the C and you get Christos. So that's that's to tell people that that's Jesus Christ in case they didn't know. Here's how I've tried to under, I've tried to understand why it is that I prefer icons to, to to a lot of art. You're welcome to put that down. I don't know. Is it still focused on that? You. Yeah, I'm just gonna put the camera back. Oh, okay. Yeah, I've, I've tried to think about this. Um, and I think here's what I've come up with. I mean, there are beautiful statues of Our Lady and, and and Christ, which I like. But it's almost like the the realer the depiction, like the the more close to reality, uh, the more I can't connect with it so for example if there was a photo of a real woman and they just said so this can be your little prayer card and it's a photograph of a real woman dressed yeah. like mary it's like yeah it's there's no room for the imagination it's yeah. it's not good enough it's something about the icon that i can connect with because there is a veil there yes you know yep the a lot of a lot of not all of but some western modern depictions of the blessed mother or christ just kind of look a little cheesy, yep. not always. Yep. The sacred things always have to be veiled. They always have to be veiled. And that's why tradition is so important, is that w once we... Uh, tradition is the vehicle that conveys to us um, these these epiphany moments, these these moments when, when God is, is revealed to us. Once you begin tinkering with tradition and subtracting things, you, you could be taking things out of there that are vitally important to having a, an epiphany down the road. Um, iconography is an example of that. Um, the, the, the modernity has a real uh, problem on its hands because in, in subtracting m mystery and tinkering with tradition, mm. um, we've, we've obscured our ability to encounter the living God. Um, there's something important about not having everything zoomed in and on focus, of being able to understand everything with mathematical precision. You need to have the veil in place. The veil needs to be over, you know, the face of a bride. So you desire her even more, you know. Um, you look at the veil in the temple, you know, it, it, it creates a sense of that which is beyond me. Well, yes, because there's more there than you think that there is. Yes. And without the veil, you might be tempted to think that's all there is. That's all there is, yeah. Yep. And, uh, and so it's the same as with iconography is that um, if it were simply a, um, like a photograph, yeah. then it's, it's reduced to the here and the now. Yes. Um, and, and, and I think that's, that's since the, um, you know, the Enlightenment or since you know, Descartes, is that we've we've hyper fixated on reality pertains to what I think. You know, if I can't think of it, then it, it does it isn't. You know, cogito ergo sum. Mm -hmm. I think, therefore I am. And so we've the past five hundred, four hundred years, we we've been experiencing kind of uh, a, a, we're on the receiving end of a new missionary religion. You know, of the empiricists and the positivists who are trying to explain and capture everything in within the limited reins of uh, human rationality. Um, and it, it just leaves no room for mystery. Um, you know, it's kind of like the guy that comes into a room and wants to talk about all the juicy details about his wife, you know? Well, 
good, but there are certain things that I not only don't want to hear, I, I cannot hear, mm. you know, that this is sacred. And you, you can't, as, as, as our, our Lord says, you know, put pearls before swine. Um, things need to be left unsaid in order for us to desire it the more. That is beautifully said, and it's a real great segue, not that we have to go here, but into modesty. Mm. Dress is a type of speech. And uh, the, you know, the reason we should consider not wearing a bikini or not wearing those terribly ripped jeans is something is being said that shouldn't be being said to me. Mm. You're saying something to me, I don't know who you are. You're saying something to me that should only be said to your yeah. husband. I, yeah. I don't want to hear those things, or I, I have no right to hear them, if you know what I mean. Right, yeah. Veil what demands the reverence. Yes, yeah. modest is hottest, as they say, right? Mm. And uh, uh, Because, it, well, it's funny, because there is some pushback on that these days, because it's been thrown around that, that, that phrase for so long. <laughs> but, yeah, modest is the most desirable. To get back to your point, it's it, it draws us into the mystery. I, I've said this a thousand times now on the show since I read The Lord of the Rings. Have you read it? I've not. Um, shame to say. Sorry to call you out on that, but uh, <laughs> but yeah, there's this bit where uh, where a Tom Bombadil re- uh, talks about Farmer Maggot, who the hobbits all viewed as some whatever simpleton, but Tom Bombadil speaks of Farmer Maggot in a way that they all realise there's way more to to Farmer Maggot than any of us thought. He's far more important than we realised. Mm. And sometimes in marriage, you get a glimpse of that in your wife. You're like, oh my gosh, here I am. I'm pottering about with this woman in the same kitchen as me. And we go out to coffee and we do these things. I don't even know who you are. Like, who are you? You know, mm. um, and, and modesty does that. Yeah, speech. It's it's important that we don't sort of share more than we should. Yeah. I mean, mm. we're, we're made in the image and likeness of God. And and God is is mystery. You know, he's, he's far beyond anything that we can uh, contain by our intellect. And so it, it, it stands to reason <laughs> that every woman that a man encounters, he at his core desires an, an encounter with mystery. You know, there, there's mm. something about her that I want that is far beyond anything I can grasp. And it, it, the more elusive it is, the, the more it, it, it attracts me, you know? Um, it could be an aspect of her her, her personality, her, her the way she thinks, the way she carries herself. Um, but when a, a woman just kind of, or it could be a man, you know, uh, when a woman just puts it all out there, is that yeah. deep down a man thinks, I was made for God, and there's nothing godly about her conduct. It, it, it repels me, mm-hmm. you know? So um, it... Uh, yeah, there's there's something to be said about the, the godliness of modesty and how it actually uh, attracts us. Mm. Was as uh, hair veiling, head veiling, uh, a thing in in the Eastern Church? I don't see it much. Yeah, they, they don't use the lace veils; they use the handkerchiefs. Oh, that's right. right. Yeah, right, right, right that's very beautiful, very yeah, feminine. Off, off the coffee table. You just <laughs> put it around. <laughs> Take it around. Put it around. Um, oddly enough, though, in, in, like in Ukraine. Um, when I lived there like 22 years ago is, um, that was, uh, pretty common in the Greek Catholic churches, but not all, mm. but in all of the Orthodox churches, uh, you have to be veiled. And in, in fact, my wife and I were going into an Orthodox church in Ukraine and they wouldn't let her in, uh, it's so un- cool until they had, so they, they have like a bin <laughs> there with all these lice ridden yeah, handkerchiefs, lice, lice handkerchiefs yeah. and they, you know, the women put her, and then they have. Like the, the the Russian Orthodox churches, they're very rigid, but I I do respect them for this. Yeah. You know, is that girls come in immodestly dressed, and um, they have s- skirts like ankle length, you know, uh, skirts, and they you know, put women will put them on, they'll put the the head covering on, then they go into the church, and uh, you know, there's there's something respectable about that. You know, I that's that's admirable. But the yeah, so the Orthodox churches really do that. Um, uh, some of the Greek Catholic churches, you see uh, women with the uh, uh, the veil over, but not as prevalent as it is in the Orthodox churches. But it, it's not the lace that you see among the women at the traditional Latin Mass. You know, even this rebellion against veiling and dressing modestly is a Cartesian overflow, I think, because the response is like, what does that have to do with anything? Yeah. 
you mean what does your body and how you wear what you wear and yeah. walk how you walk what does that have to do with anything as if i'm only an intellect and so long as my heart is in the right place then i can dress however i want you know? yeah and, and and this is an even older outflow from a nominalism mm. that which is an attack against i think the you know the the the, the spirit of god that that vivifies and unifies uh, all of us into an organic whole you know but nothing is related to anything else you know we're just a, a clump yeah. of individuals that have have no organic interdependency or uh connection and so you know what what does it matter what if i have a, a veil on it doesn't affect my soul doesn't affect your soul it's not connected to anything at all and um but in fact it it is you know it, it uh, how we how we comport ourselves uh impacts my soul i think what people find difficult as they try to try to do this is how do I become passionate about these things, say dressing modestly, wearing a veil in church, doing these sorts of things, without becoming a Pharisee, without becoming a angry, shaming yeah. individual. Um, that's the needle we want to thread because I think women have had that experience of people saying something that embarrasses them or shames yeah. them. And uh, that's not a good way to convince anyone, you know, but you know, we take our, our lead from our Lord himself and our Lord is uh, perfect respecter of our free will, even to the point of eternal damnation. You know, God, it's blasphemy to say that God condemns people to hell. That's absolute blasphemy to say that God condemns anyone to hell. It's uh, or that God, you know, inflicts suffering on people eternally. This is what they do by their own abuse of their free will, and and He uh, respects that choice. This is what you've chosen. Um, and I think the same pastors need to follow that example is that, um, you know, we're not going to conform people into a, you know, a cookie cookie uh, cutter model of parish life where you have to wear your, you know, canvas ankle length pants and eat cabbage and then you're holy. Um, but you, you preach modesty. And um, if, if people get to the point where, yeah, you know, I, I should be doing something that reflects my inner disposition to to uh, prepare myself for encounter with my groom, uh, both mystical groom and my earthly groom, then yeah, I, I should I should probably do something about my dress that reflects that. But to go out, you know, and uh, with a, you know, with a, a, a you know, a, a stick, and uh, to uh, compel people to externally, um, uh, you know, meet that demand and and, and dress that way. Well, then you're just you've reduced you've reduced uh, free will to uh, religious formalism. Yeah, like modesty is primarily an issue of the heart, but sometimes the tail can wag the dog. You know, yes. so it's like making you dress this way will then teach me interiorly. Yeah, but then we're we're we're, we're at the point of, of being a Pharisee if we're, we're if we stay there if we stay there. Yeah, yeah. You you, you want to. Um, but, but this is how we're all taught. I understand, like, we don't want to remain at the externals, but the reason you teach manners to your children, even though in the beginning it is only external, right. is you, you want this to seep in. You, you want to right. turn the heart, teach the heart. So you say to your son or your daughter, say thank you, because you don't want them to be somebody who goes through life expecting everything given to them or something to yeah. be given to them. Yeah. yeah. I, I think we run the risk of... Uh, of you know, re reducing the uh, reducing the faith to the you know the externals, which are um, good customs and yeah. are are um, often worthy and good conduits uh, for w which can dispose us towards virtue. You know, but they're they're merely instruments. Um, so I. You know, like my, my my wife and kids that they don't my girls they don't veil themselves uh, in church or anything, but um, it it uh, you know there, there's something beautiful about about um, you know people that that still observe that and um, and uh, yeah. Hmm. All right. Well, hey, this is lovely. Thank you. Anything else you want to address? Throw out there. Mention your church one last time. <laughs> <laughs> before we wrap up thanks so much yes. for taking the trip out here and being with us this has been really inspiring well glory to god yeah it's um you know i just want to tell your your, your listeners that uh um you know the, the worst enemy is not the enemy uh who's at the gate uh intimidating you uh with with fear um and uh gloom and doom 
the worst enemy is the one who's in your heart and is trying to have you capitulate before the great battle uh, because he knows when the great battle comes it's already been decided um, so uh, our greatest your greatest moment the moment of your sanctification the moment when you are going to be a hero uh, is is near and these days were made for you and you are meant to be here and now to be the saints that the future generations will know and love. So fight and proclaim to all that Christ is risen, and he is risen indeed. Glory to Jesus Christ. Thank you so much.